Good morning. Welcome to the second annual symposium of the Houston Methodist Institute for Robotics, Imaging and Navigation. Streaming live from the Bakey CV Education Studios at Houston Methodist, I'm Dr. Stuart Carr, Director of Innovation Engineering for the DeBakey Heart and Vascular Center. And joining me in the studio is Dr. Alan Lumsden, Director of the DeBakey Heart and Vascular Center and Chair of the Department of Cardiovascular Surgery. Now, before we proceed, I'd like the audience uh, I'd like to ask the audience to come into our conversation. So please submit your questions via web at pollev.com using debakey as the username or text debakey to 37607 alongside your question. And you can also add your question into the YouTube live stream. So as you will see, we have a fantastic lineup of speakers and content for today's show. Um, we're going to disseminate advancements in the fields of surgical robotics, extended reality and image guided navigation and here's a, a quick overview there of our speakers and you will see from the agenda and um, the times that they're on and also their talk titles etc here is the first session of the agenda and it's really you know we're looking at robotics and imaging systems outside the houston area you know what they're doing kind of nationally and internationally and then we bring it back home and we're going to hear what we're doing inside houston methodist and um, we've got a couple of nice surprises at the end that we're going to launch. It's something we've been working on uh, for a good year and a half, so please stay tuned. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to, to Dr. Lumsden for his comments on, on Mirren. Well, Stuart, thank you, and thank you for organising this. Uh, really, the concept of Mirren is that uh, we are the biggest Siemens install in the world, so we really have huge amount of interest and expertise in imaging. Uh, I've also been interested in robotics, and my interest was really in catheter robotics with the original Hansen robot, now Corindus. But it was pretty obvious that in the medical world, it seems to me like imaging is great, robotics are great, but the ability to combine robotics with clinical imaging seems to me the way that you're going to drive this to the future. And so we created this organization. We are shamelessly trying to copy what has been done at Imperial College with the Hamlin Institute. I had an opportunity to go over there several years ago and, and was blown away with this. And so this whole concept is to try to leverage the, the power that we have in the hospital around robotics, combine it with imaging, and use that to try and entice many of our guests to come and work with us and, and play in this new forum. So thank you again for putting this on, Stuart. I, more than anybody, will learn from listening to your experts today. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lumsden. So I'm going to go straight to our first guest. Uh, we have Dr. Anne majowitz Fay. Uh, she is an associate professor at the University of Texas at Austin's Walker Department for Mechanical Engineering and the Corkle School of Engineering. Now, she runs the Human Enabled Robotic Technology Lab, and her research interests focus on the interface between humans and robotic systems with an emphasis on improving the delivery of surgical and interventional care, both for the patient and the provider. And the title of her talk today is From Tool to Assistant Towards Developing Adaptive Surgical Robots for the Operating Room. Great, thank you so much. Um, can everyone hear me and see the slides okay? Yes, beautiful. Um, so I'm, I'm sorry to disappoint. I agree that the, the connection between robotics and imaging is critically important to advance um, robotic uh, surgery for the future. Um, unfortunately, I won't talk too much about imaging today, but I think an equally important area is, is better understanding the surgeon operator and designing methods to assist them better. So, so that'll be the topic for today. Um, uh, although I will definitely agree that imaging is, is a, a, definitely holds the key to the future as well. Um, so my name is Anne Mayevich Fai. I'm the um, assistant pro uh, associate professor at the University of Texas at Dallas, and I uh, run the Hero Lab, uh, Human Enabled Robotic Technology. And our goal is to improve human health by trans translating effective human uh, robotic technology into clinical use. Um, and these are just a few pictures of my lab. Um, I'm at the University of Texas at Dallas, where we have a newly renovated. Um, historic gym actually for uh, surgical robotics robotics research in general and we have quite a few of us that also do surgical robotics um so there's just some pictures in my lab we actually have an old basketball court that's still in our in our lab um and there's some really fascinating faculty that also work at texas robotics um and i think you'll be able to hear from at least one of us later today um with farshid al Begi also talking so um we're we're enthusiastic to partner with other uh, medical uh, providers, especially if you have some great ideas for robotic technology. So please feel free to reach out to us um, if you're looking for some collaborators. 
Okay, so um, the focus of my talk is going to focus on surgical education. And, and why do I think this is such an important piece in creating the, the next generation of surgical robots? Um, some estimates say that um, medical human generated medical errors are what actually the third leading cause of death after heart disease and cancer. These were statistics that were found sort of pre-COVID, so that may may be changed now. Um, but regardless, um, uh, morbidities associated with human-generated errors uh, are quite large, um, even though they're not actually tracked in the same way that heart disease and cancer are, um, because they're not diseases. Um, and so, you know, over the years, many institutions have developed different types of platforms to assist with uh, training, where um, we might have box trainers or some procedural specific trainers um, in virtual reality that have been developed, which are which have been shown to be very beneficial for basic training. Um, getting people to actually come in and try to use some of these systems can be sometimes challenging. Um, but where these systems sort of fall short is um, finding ways to assist higher level surgeons more at your um, uh, first, you know, first year practicing that surgeons, have been developed, which are, following. which have been shown to be very bad. Oh, sorry. I think there's a echo here <clears throat> to become more personalized, effective, and online. So um, one of the one of the tr approaches that we're trying to take uh, in my lab is if the goal is to design robotic systems that can assist the user in an online way, we need to be able to have methods to sense and model surgeon interaction in a near real time fashion. Um, so on this chart, I'm sort of showing you know, what, what kind of methods do we have to be able to sense human operators um, in terms of the time uh, that it takes to obtain those assessments, how much effort and cost it takes, and also how much computational effort. So, um, you know, the, the gold standard for a lot of surgical skill assessment right now are checklists where you might look at things like depth perception, bimanual dexterity, efficiency, um, the ability to control the robotic system. And these are typically just scales, you know, a scale of one to five, some expert surgeon providing their assessment of, of what a trainee might be doing. And more recently, there's been some great technology coming out of, you know, Intuitive Surgical with their DB Logger, um, CSATs, and also the OR Black Box for surgical, um, from Surgical Safety Systems, Safety Technologies, which promise to um, record data, lots of data in an online way to be able to come up with machine learned um, assessments of what was happening in the operating room, the inherent skills of the user, uh, and things like that. And these are great systems because they take a lot of data, but it can take time to actually get the downloaded assessments from these companies. Um, you don't necessarily have access to the raw computed metrics in real time. And that's um, and so for us, that's that's really important because our goal, as I mentioned, is um, uh, automated control. So, so the goal for our lab is to really develop systems that can assist human users that are performing um, surgery with a surgical robot with online adaptive guidance. Um, and in order to do that, some of the some of the um, sensor systems that we have available to us that are real time could include things like the um, inertial measurement units, so measuring someone's acceleration, looking at their muscle activity uh, through EMG sensing. We've even done some work where we look at brain activity and EEG sensors, um, position trackers, heart rate monitors. Those are all human worn um, sensors that do give us information about human performance and human uh, physiological response in an online way. But then the key is how do you take that data and actually make something useful out of it um, to be able to enable real-time control? So, so that's sort of um, what, what our lab really focuses on. <clears throat> so um, a few of the topics that we might touch on today, and, and I think in, in interest of time, we'll cover some of these in much more higher detail than others. Um, but evaluating the impact of having a robot when you're um, when you're actually doing uh, surgery or surgical training, understanding bi manual coordination, and also um, we uh, um, also um, surgical style. So the importance of surgical style in understanding expertise. So first for robot presence, um, 
at UT Southwestern, which is where I do a lot of my collaborative work, <clears throat> they have an established robotics curriculum, which consists of nine different tasks. And we wanted to evaluate the role of virtual reality pre-training on the ability to learn these nine tasks. So we took the nine tasks and found matched virtual reality tasks on the VR system. And um, we recruited um, several subjects to participate in this study. Overall, we had 107 subjects. Um, of those, only 18 subjects actually wanted to do the VR pre-training pre curriculum. So then we found matched controls. And I think that's the first important point is that, um, you know, only 17% of the trainees elected to participate in the study. Um, and I think that's kind of a, a common challenge across the board, getting trainees to actually come into the sim lab uh, to, to do experiments. Um, Okay, so then the next thing we saw is that there was no statistically significant different scores uh, before or after robotic training between the groups. So in the end, you know, the VR training didn't necessarily assist the users all that much. Um, we did see that there was this weekly significant uh, effect that the VR training, pre-training would lower the number of uh, repetitions you needed to achieve proficiency in the robotics curriculum. So that suggests in a slight way that you might be able to speed up training through VR. <clears throat> and then I think what's what's what is very important though to realize is that the VR subjects, the VR trained subjects actually had significantly lower scores on pattern cutting than the non-VR subjects. And why is that really important? Well, it's important because if the virtual reality um, uh, environments are not realistic enough, there's a good chance that you could actually create uh, negative training effects um, if you're not evaluating your VR system adequately. Um, okay, and then we also saw that for more challenging tasks like running uh, running and cutting rubber bands, pattern cutting, running suture, um, those actually all had um, significantly higher scores for just the robotic tasks um, than the VR in pre-training, sorry, in post-training. And so that indicates that even though VR might be useful to sort of help people speed up their, their learning curve on the robotic console itself, there is still a lot of value in continuing to do training tasks on the robotic system. So we wanted to evaluate this a little bit more and really try to understand, you know, what is it about the doing tasks on a robot versus doing tasks on a VR system that change human behavior or, or affect users in some way. So, um, so we brought in a few um, subjects to participate in this study where we wanted them to do the same tasks both on the robotic system and on the VR system. And then we recorded a bunch of very human-centric measurements. Um, we looked at video, we looked at muscle activity, we looked at galvanic skin response, uh, joint accelerations and velocities, and joint and hand positions, um, and wanted to analyze all this data. And here's some of the really interesting things that we saw as a result of that. Even though the tasks were exactly the same and matched, the, um, the tasks on the robot, which is in the dark uh, gray had much lower economy of volume, which is great. And I'm sorry, they they had um they had not great. They had a lower economy of volume and a higher path length, um, which means those tasks were actually um, objectively harder than the VR tasks. And then we also saw that muscle activity was higher for the robotic tasks. Um, and there was maybe some indication that galvanic skin response was a little worse also for subjects doing the same task on the robot, but it wasn't statistically significant. Either way, these very large, significantly different errors between the exact same task versus, you know, you're doing a procedure on a virtual reality version of the task versus the real robot and a real physical object were very significantly different. Um, and so, so that to us kind of indicates the need to really understand the human element of human robot interaction and make sure that if we're designing systems that are virtual, that they maintain this level of realism because that realistic aspect of training um, can drastically change human behavior. Um, and, and that could have really important lasting effects on, on learning uh, certain tasks. Okay, so related to trying to understand humans better, um, one of the big areas within my lab is trying to understand bimanual coordination. 
So if you look at these two videos, you'll see that there's, you know, definitely some differences in the expert doing this task versus a novice. And one of the gears domains that are used in our checklists to be able to assess surgical skill is this bimanual dexterity. So does someone just use one hand and they kind of ignore their non-dominant hand, meaning they have poor coordination, versus an expert, they expertly use both hands in a complementary way um, to, to provide optimal surgical performance. Um, and so we're really interested in studying this bimanual dexterity because from the perspective of a robotic system, we actually don't have any methods at all to be able to quantify bimanual dexterity in an online way. Um, and so this has been a big uh, topic for one of my PhD students. Um, some in terms of history, like some work that we have been able to do on the robotic side is um, come up with methods to decompose movement into gestures or kinematic synergies. Um, often this is an analytical method that you can't necessarily do online um, where you're looking at like principal components of different uh, data vectors. But what we wanted to look at instead was really trying to look at sort of this 50,000 foot level, like what are all the possible ways that my two hands could be coordinated and can I measure those things? So you could have hands that are moving together to do a single target task. The movements themselves could be symmetric. Um, within symmetry, you could have point symmetric movements where you're sort of rotating about a common point versus mirror symmetric. Your hands are doing the exact same thing. They're just kind of mirrored around um, the vertical axis. And you can also have um, two target tasks that have elements of symmetry. So, you know, holding an object and moving the entire object with both of your hands. Um, you can also pull your hands apart. You can move them in parallel um, and so on and so forth. So we also looked at effects of scaling. So like one hand moving more than the other hand and sequence where one hand may start moving and then the other hand starts after that. Um, so we sort of saw this as a way to decompose all possible bimanual motions um, that actually are quite relevant um, also for surgical skill and surgical assessment. Um, so this was sort of our taxonomy of, of bimanual movement. Um, and we started first by really trying to understand the way in which these, these movements can be coordinated. Um, and so we developed a, a virtual reality human subjects training task where we had these um, leader um, um, balls that were moving on the screen for all the different types of coordinated movements. And we, we asked the human user to follow those movements uh, using these two haptic devices. The reason why these haptic devices were useful was then we could actually measure the movement data from the haptic devices and use that to better analyze how well a human user was able to follow these bimanual tasks. Um, so some interesting things that we found from this experiment, um, you know, some that are very obvious. So two target tasks are objectively harder to track than a single target task. Um, we also saw that if we studied the human movement, higher jerk actually correlated to better performance, um, which is a little counterintuitive since a lot of the initial studies in, in human motor control suggest that humans try to minimize jerk when they're when they're doing tasks like reaching movements. Um, but a lot of our studies so far have shown that it's actually very different for surgical performance and surgical training. Higher jerk is actually more indicative of expertise. Um, if you scale movements, you negatively impact the, the opposite hand. And one thing that I thought was really interesting was that if you're moving both hands simultaneously, your non-dominant hand will perform worse in simultaneous tasks. Um, and that's not true for the dominant hand. Um, and, and the non-dominant hand will perform worse than it would have if you just let the hand move in a sequential which is kind of interesting. Um, so, so those were just kind of us trying to understand, you know, how does the human coordinate both of their hands together? And of course, what, where we wanted to go next is now how do we take this methodology to be able to enable future robotic assistance for bimanual tasks? And again, as I mentioned before, why this is so important is that we have no methods right now in the robotics community to be able to understand the way in which someone coordinates two hands. Um, so I'm going to skip this slide just in interest of time, but just to show that we found ways to be able to par parameterize the movements that someone might make in a way that we can measure geometrically. So just by studying the kinematic movements. Um, and in addition to this, we've made our methods online. So all I have to do is continuously monitor the kinematic data stream from a surgeon operator, and I'll be able to um, classify what movements they have through this geometric framework. 
So I'll sort of skip over this and you're, here you can just sort of see a video of the human subject that was doing this experiment. Um, and then generally what our framework is doing is it samples kinematic data, it processes it based, based on this geometric framework we have, computes features of are you symmetric, what direction are you moving, is there an element of rotation in your movements, um, and then we sort of predict, uh, we predict the, the, the actual um, movement that you have. And this prediction framework has really high accuracy um, in terms of especially uh, movements that are together parallel and away. And for um, mirrored movements, we actually do quite well with the exception of us trying to get someone to do an incongruent movement. And that's not so much a factor of our method being bad, but more that humans have a really hard time doing two very different things with both of their hands. So it's the whole pat your head and try to like rub your tummy at the same time. We can't really do that. Um, and so it's hard to get our human subjects to actually do pure incongruent movements. Um, but anyway, so um, so then what we did is take take this framework um, to then try to analyze um, human movement uh, better. In, in a surgical context. And um, we were able to see that um, for things like making a C loop, we were able to find um, symmetry features that, that, are, um, that are point symmetric. And for suture pulling, um, uh, we were able to find that uh, symmetry features of actually pulling your hands apart. <clears throat> um, so then, then we took the jigsaw data set um, that was, uh, posted by um, Johns Hopkins University and um, uh, analyzed all of those movements in terms of um, uh, passing the needle, uh, doing a knot tie, and we also looked at differences between experts and novices. Um, but we saw some really interesting things where, you know, you may normally expect that for transferring a needle, you'd see a lot of these mirror movements, which we do. And that's kind of the most commonly classified one. Um, also for pulling suture, you would expect to see a lot of moving away, which we do. Um, we also see a lot of movements where you're pulling your hands apart. Um, interestingly, for the rotational cases, we were expecting to see more point symmetric movements when you're sort of tying a knot. Um, but interestingly, the movements tend to start in this point symmetric way, but then they transition very quickly to, to mirrored and, and moving together. So um, so there's still a lot for us to study within that within that context. Um, but it's at least a, a first starting point um, in, in trying to better understand um, uh, these bimanual motions in a quantitative online way. Um, and then maybe the last thing I'll sort of um, end with here is um, just in terms of time and, and the fact that I have to go teach a class. Um, <clears throat> uh, what we're working on right now is a data set where we're collecting expert surgeon data um, at UT Southwestern and having them do both virtual reality, robotic, and procedural specific tasks. And we're getting surgeons from urology, um, OBGYN, and um, general surgery. And so one of the biggest problems in a lot of the surgical skill assessment literature is just the lack of an open data set. Um, and so hopefully soon within a few months, we'll, we'll publish this and make it openly available to the greater research community. Um, so yes, so I think I'll, I'll stop there just in interest of time and um, see if there's any questions. Well, thank you very much, Dorothy. That was absolutely fascinating. I have a lot of questions, but I think I'll reach out to you offline because I know you've got a, a, a time commitment here. Uh, Dr. Lumsden, you got time for a quick question? Yeah, th thank you. I was kind of engrossed. So you've kind of done what, what we've been thinking about, and that is see the obvious relationship between VR training and robotics. Can you just philosophically talk to a little bit about your thought processes around that? Yeah, so you know, I think a lot of times these VR systems are developed, and they're and you you might have a couple surgeons that evaluate it, and then the companies then just push it out. and And I think the big problem with that is especially for very refined tasks like suturing, cutting tissue that's deformable. Our methods are just so. Our our methods to be able to um, render those realistically are, are really poor. But then when you break realism and then you force somebody to train for a long period of time in this unnatural and unrealistic mm -hmm. environment, there's a, a chance that you could have um, negative effects of the training. So so actually training bad behaviors, like learning the wrong way to ride the bike and then you can't unlearn that. And so I think that 
that for me is, is really important and really powerful and why that first study was so important when I first started looking at this data that, you know, if nobody's looking at this, you know, there's a chance that our, you know, industry could be creating really bad <laughs> simulators that actually have really bad effects long term. And, and that really um, is why we're doing a lot of this very human centric type of assessment when it comes to uh, surgical robots, VR environments, um, and even looking at things like open skills and laparoscopic skills. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, I think we are going on to our next speaker now, if they're online. Leave there. Okay, so our next speaker um, is Dr. Chow. He is an incoming assistant professor at Case Western Reserve University. And he's actually just finished a PhD over at Stanford in Professor Alison Okamara's Charm Lab, which is the collaborative haptics and robotics in medicine lab. And he's here today to talk to us about haptic feedback for enhancing performance in robotic assisted surgery. Cool. Uh, hi. So just let me know if, uh, uh, you know, you can't hear me or anything, but my name is Zhang Chua and uh, I'm in the Department of Electrical and Computer Systems Engineering from uh, Case Western uh, Reserve University. And today I'll be talking about haptic feedback for enhancing performance in robot assisted surgery. So in robot assisted surgery, surgeons, you know, have to overcome the lack of haptics wow. in common platforms such as the Da Vinci to, and you know, they generally achieve high performance, uh, as can be seen by, you know, typical learning curves like this one from, from a radical prostatectomy. It takes a while, but eventually surgeons do start to hit a uh, plateau in terms of procedure time indicating that, you know, they're achieving this sort of proficiency. And then this really begs the question, uh, you know, if, if surgeons are able to uh, do haptics, uh, no, do RAS without haptics, then, you know, what is the place of haptics in, uh, you know, doing robotic surgery, especially for people like uh, me who are interested in haptics and robotics? And so today I'll be talking about two ideas and I would like to introduce two ideas of how we can use haptics in RAS. The first is uh, haptic error amplification for dexterity improvement. And the second is uh, visual haptic training to improve uh, tissue handling skill. So for haptic error amplification, it really boils down and is motivated and informed by this idea from uh, the sensory motor control uh, neuroscience literature in that prediction error uh, is thought to drive learning. So in a typical kind of model-based sensory motor control paradigm, you have motor controls and your current state estimate of the world. And uh, it goes through, you know, a forward model of your arm dynamics, as well as a model of what we call sensory output, which is basically a model of the environment. And it generates predictions that can be informed by uh, sensory feedback and ultimately this creates an error signal that can be used to update uh, our belief about the world and its environment as well as our internal models. And uh, with that, the, the neuroscience community has actually, you know, uh, grappled with two different uh, paradigms in terms of feedback. The first is the guidance hypothesis, which states that assistive uh, feedback like haptics can result in over-reliance on the feedback, which implies different, uh, you know, uh, or reduced performance when the feedback is removed. And the second idea here I'd like to introduce is uh, that they have looked at is uh, error amplification in which uh, it really is boils down to increasing the amount of error generated by the user and therefore, the belief is that if error drives learning, we can uh, sort of hijack this learning system to uh, create better learning outcomes. And this has been uh, tested in uh, stroke subjects doing reaching tasks where the training forces that magnify error actually produce better improvement in the initial direction of reach. And we studied this for uh, RAS in virtual reality. Uh, using the assisted teleoperation with augmented reality framework designed by Nimai and Ayati, one of our, our, our collaborators while I was at Stanford. Uh, and we chose a ring on wire steady hand task uh, that's, you know, quite typical of uh, laparoscopic, you know, fundamental tr uh, training drills.
And in, in this task, we provide orientation and position feedback. So orientation, uh, we measure orientation error and position error and provide some form of force feedback that is proportional to the error in two directions, right? So we can do this in a way, uh, form of guidance, uh, which we call the convergent force field, where the forces are actually pulling you into the correct orientation and position. We can also do this in an error amplifying manner by creating a divergent force field that pushes the user or participant away from the ideal orientation and position. We can measure participant accuracy or trainee accuracy using uh, measures that track orientation error and position error. And we can use the total time as a proxy for speed, the total time to complete this task. And to measure the, the ability of a participant to trade off uh, speed and accuracy, we can use a combined error time metric, which is the product of the time taken as well as the, the, uh, uh, the path errors uh, that we were measuring. And we recruited our participant group, half of which were healthcare trainees and randomly assigned them to either the convergent field, the divergent force field, uh, as well as this null force field, which is our control condition where there was no haptics uh, given to them. And then we got them to train over four days under the assigned feedback condition with uh, Day one also, we also did a null baseline evaluation to get a sense of where they were at before they started their training. And then after four days, we, we did the null evaluation on day five. So what we finally, I'll just uh, go over the highlights here, uh, is that training with error amplifying or no feedback really results in the high performance metrics, uh, high performance over all the metrics, which you know, basically confirms the guidance hypothesis, right? Uh, so we have our baseline uh, performance for all the metrics and uh, at evaluation, you see that learning occurs uh, and performance improves for all the metrics. But the one we found that had a statistically significant effect was the combined error time or the speed accuracy. And there was a pairwise uh, difference in terms of performance for the null and the convert between the null and the convergent groups. Uh, another thing we looked at was how the haptic training condition would affect participants of different skill levels. And we can really look at that by plotting the evaluation metric versus their base, their metric at baseline, with this gray line being the unity line that uh, demarcates the zone of disimprovement versus improvement. So what I mean by that is that if you had a baseline, if an individual had a baseline metric score of A, uh, let's say, and they, you know, in evaluation, they were, they did more, they, their metric was higher than A, then they were in the disimprovement zone. If they were equal to A, then, you know, they didn't improve at all or deprove, uh, disimprove. So they were on the line. And if they scored lower, then they improved. So the one metric that we found uh, had statistically significant effect was really the, the combined error time. Once again, there was a significant interaction between the condition and baseline ability to predict final evaluation performance for CET, uh, i.e. error application. What we found was area amplification benefits the lower speed accuracy participants more. So let me dig into this a uh, little bit. Uh, so let's say for the, the, the convergent group here, we find that, you know, there's this downward sloping trend, which really speaks to how it really benefits the low speed accuracy participants much more than the high speed uh, accuracy participants. But when we look at the divergent uh, force field, we see that, yes, the low speed accuracy participants do benefit, and, but also the high speed accuracy participants had some benefit. Ultimately, this resulted in everyone achieving um, about the same uh, evaluation CET. And then for the null group, we see that in the end, it benefits the high speed accuracy participants more so than the low speed accuracy. So there, there is this upward sloping trend that kind of flattens out. Ultimately, what our results show is that haptic error amplification is, uh, is a useful component for improving dexterous RS skills and trainees of varying speed, uh, speed accuracy. 
uh, you know, EA or error amplification and null feedback really results in the more learning in the experiment time frame. But EA benefits across all speed accuracy baselines, right? So strong improvement in lower speed accuracy participants, but some improvement in high speed accuracy participants. And what this really means, you know, the whole thing means is to us at least, and what's exciting is that there's potential to use a combination of these haptic conditions based on participant speed accuracy, we think. And uh, this is a definitely an uh, area of future work that uh, I like to look into. So moving on, in the interest of time, I'll talk a little bit about visual haptic training to improve tissue handling skills as another use of haptics for RAS training. And to, uh, here I define visual haptics as the mapping of visual cues to uh, force. So the visual cues here are displacement, tissue displacement, deformation, as well as the color change in tissue when uh, blood, blood flow is constricted, uh, to name a couple e examples. And uh, this is what we think is really behind visual haptic uh, mapping is, uh, once again, this internal model that I introduced earlier. Uh, if you can see on the bottom right, the, there's this thing called the common gain. Essentially, to control engineers, the bottom loop here is really a common filter mechanism and allows us to probabilistically integrate haptics and vision to estimate forces. So the, for haptics, let's say you want a measure of force and there are probability distributions. One uh, distribution can be um, gained from haptic sense as well as from vision. And these can be probabilistically combined to create integrated sensory feedback that we can use to update uh, our internal models. So the question really then was, uh, would adding information-rich haptics improve our internal models? And we think that this is possible because experienced uh, RAS surgeons report embodying their tools uh, to the extent that they almost feel the forces just by looking at um, the interaction with tissue. And this could be due to a strong visual haptic mapping uh, that we would like to accelerate in trainees. Uh, therefore, the question is, would training with haptics enable these better visual haptic internal models of tissue stiffness and therefore improve tissue handling ability? We got participants to perform a visual haptic force estimation tasks. Uh, in this case, quite an abstract task where they were instructed to exert varying amounts of force on this mock silicone kind of tissue stem, we like to call it, you know, and um, we overlaid some color change uh, using augmented reality, as well as uh, the other visual cue here is of uh, uh, tissue displacement. And uh, they, they were instructed to exert the force. We gave them text feedback uh, uh, during the training of their force errors so they, they could do better on the next try uh, during their learning. And we evaluated them on the learn task, but also a novel task where we swapped uh, the maneuver out for palpation using a probe on the same material. So participants were then assigned to one of three haptic training conditions. First is the uh, manual condition with a motion scaling of one is to one. We, it's uh, very similar to what you would feel in open surgery, we, uh, that was the goal. And then uh, we did the teleoperation scheme with haptics with a two is to one motion scaling. And the lastly, our control condition and our evaluation condition was the typical uh, RES setup, teleoperation without haptics. Participants learned to exert five different forces on the tissue stem uh, here, and then in, in the assigned training uh, group. And then in evaluation, we just evaluate them in this teleoperation without haptics, eight forces for the learn task, and then four forces for the, the novel task. And what we found was that for force error, which is the actual force minus the target force that they were instructed to exert, uh, ultimately, a proprioception heuristic was used for the learn task, i.e. They, they did not form an internal model or use an internal model. Uh, we can see this from the plots here where the manual group, which is uh, the, in green, started to diverge from the teleoperated group. And this is because mo movement scaling uh, was different during training as in evaluation for the manual group. And thus they were really, what we found was that everyone was using the position of a hand, their hand, as a proxy to estimate force, which was, uh, you know, quite a, a disappointing result. More 
encouraging uh, encouragingly though is that our speed accuracy metrics suggested that the Mano group was uh, able to use some type of prior haptic experience to generalize to the uh, novel task where here our metric was the normalized absolute error time and uh, you, can you see in green here that for the reference forces of one and three newtons, this speed accuracy was lower for a uh, better for the manual group. So the manual group had lower error time. And ultimately, we think that this is due to generalizing to uh, material compression uh, that they ex experience uh, in daily living because it was scale matched to their training. It happened in a one is to one scale, like in their training. So our results. A uh, hint that haptic training, you know, is a promising approach for improving uh, visual haptic models and thus tissue handling ability. But we need to match the scaling of prior haptic training to better compensate for these proprioceptive biases and you use scale match priors for generalization. So we really think that uh, the, the haptic training should be incorporated into robotics as opposed to being done in laparoscopy or open surgery uh, as a pre-training to robotics. The, and future work will really try to investigate uh, our transfer transferability of these findings to more complex and relevant tasks. So in my talk today, I hope I managed to answer the question to some extent uh, about the possible place of haptics in robot assisted surgery from a training perspective with haptic error amplification, as well as visual haptic training. And before I end off, I'd like to, uh, you know, uh, see this idea that haptics is a really rich and fundamental source of information that humans use for manipulation. And if we use the right, uh, you, by, you know, use the neuroscience concepts of sensory motor control, we can try and really leverage this richness of haptics to enhance telesurgical performance uh, from a training uh, perspective so that in uh, real surgery, even without haptics, we perform or uh, surgeons actually perform better. And with that, I'd like to end off by acknowledging all the individuals who have contributed to this work, as well as the funding sources. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much for that. Um, you know, again, a lot of questions, but I think my initial question, you're talking about this visual haptic feedback, and it seems to me like there's a certain kind of cognitive network, like a neuroscience kind of approach to this. You know, there's mm -hmm. something happening in your brain, right? Just like if you were to close your eyes and think about different textures, you know, like imagine putting your hand on a tree or um, feeling grass, you know, you can get a kind of sensation in your head that's built up about feeling those textures. So, like, is anyone looking into that kind of neuroreceptive kind of pathway? It seems like, you know, you're looking yeah. at it from a training tool, but what about the actual mechanism of action? Uh, from my own, uh, you know, literature reviews and stuff, I, I don't think that this is something that uh, I've come across uh, sp specifically from a, a more fundamental kind of a neural pathway thing. But I think, uh, you know, with the advent or the popularity of, you know, the metaverse, VR and AR, uh, you know, I've seen a lot more chatter about, you know, looking into this and even this idea that certain individuals, and this comes into phenomenology, uh, the field of phenomenology about embodiment. And there is some research showing that certain individuals are more receptive to uh, embodying their tools and having uh, impressions of it. And I'm not sure, but I really think this, this is a very interesting uh, effect that, uh, that you know, researchers are looking into as we you know, transition into a more VR and AR kind of paradigm that certain individuals have a great, uh, this natural tendency to uh, somehow embody tools cool. better. Okay, let's, um, thank you very much again for coming to the show. You know, I think we need to pop on to our next speaker now in the interest of time, unless Dr. Lumsden, you oh, okay. good. I think this con, I've never heard of visual haptics before. I was frantically trying to research it while you we were talking. And I think it's brilliant because it's probably the biggest criticism. It's what everybody says, well, there's no haptic feedback. You know, surgeons think they need haptic feedback. It's hard to know exactly how much of that is true, and you can certainly put the lie to that or validate it. So thank you. Cool. Thank you very much. 
Okay, so moving on to our next speaker, uh, we have Dr. Michael Yip. Uh, he is Associate Professor of Electrical and Computer Engineering at the University of California, San Diego. He's an IEEE RES Distinguished Lecturer, Hellman Fellow and Director of the Advanced Robotics and Controls Laboratory, or the ARC Lab. His group currently focuses on solving problems in data efficient and computationally efficient robotic control and motion planning through the use of various forms of learning representations, including deep learning, and reinforcement learning strategies. And today he's going to talk to us about engineering intelligent robotics for surgery at University of California, San Diego. Michael, pleasure to have you on the show. Thank you. Um, let me, sorry, let me just try to reshare, optimize for video clips. All right, good. Um, all right, so um, thanks everybody for uh, um, listening to my talk and thank you for uh, hosting such a great event. So let me get started. Um, I wanted to talk today about um, engineering robotic situational awareness um, for surgery. Uh, by the way, I'll put, apologize. I'm right now on paternity leave, so I have to stay at home and uh, there might be some background noise if, uh, if that's the case, you'll know what that is. Okay, so. Um, just a quick overview uh, of what we're doing at UCSD. In San Diego, we have a medical robotics laboratory. Um, our focus uh, of the laboratory is in a couple of areas, surgical robotics, robot human interaction, robots at home, and assistive and wearable robotics. So we have about 16 robotics research labs co-located all physically together in one um, uh, large research building. and. We have a, uh, one of the biggest advantages we have here is also a ability to schedule our own operations. <clears throat> um, and so we can do a lot of our testing, you know, on site and basically at our own schedules. And we have a strong collaboration with our school of medicine, the uh, VA communities and our health clinics. Now, regarding um, the research that we do in my lab, uh, we're always pushing towards a vision for, um, what surgical robotics uh, can deliver um, in terms of accessibility. And that means providing high quality, um, consistent, immediate surgery across uh, socioeconomic borders. But of course, um, we know that there is uh, a shortage of doctors in the, uh, in the US and the training is just not matching the pace at which uh, we're seeing the pop patient population rise. And so one of the ways that we can meet this demand, and honestly, the original um, premise for robotic surgery was uh, remotely guided surgery, right? And so um, that's what all the Da Vinci robots were built off, uh, uh, at least the concepts had originated from. Um, and uh, so, so another thing that we can start looking and thinking about is how much of the robot itself can can um, can be the uh, can can have the intelligence to perform certain actions or do some certain recommendations um, that will help assist in surgeries. Yeah. Um, so so we we have uh, focused a lot on the telesurgical aspect um, and what that barrier between you know, having a robot between you you as a doctor and and the patient uh, brings you. Now, one of the immediate challenges of trying to do telerobotics is uh, once you go to uh, you know to some non-negligible distance, um, you start encountering latency. Um, that's just the nature of you know how fast a communication signal can you know transmit from one location to another, and that latency uh, certainly causes problems in hand-eye coordination. And so, you can just see a simple you know suturing task. From the left with delay and without delay, and on the right with delay, for our um, surgeon, and uh, it is significantly more difficult and takes more time, and you make a lot more errors. And so, this is statistically proven. So, what can we do to uh, help with this? Well, some of the easiest technologies we can do is just basically augmenting uh, uh, cues in the visual perception that's provided to the doctor. And that's a theme that will come up a lot in my talk, which is basically looking at the uh, images coming back from, this, from the robot and trying to analyze them and have either cues be presented or cues that, that the robot can actually take use of. 
So in this case, the the key question is that we know. Oops, uh, let me go back. So we know um, we know where the instruments want to go, right? To the to uh, when you're remote and you're trying to operate on somebody um, that's far away, you are commanding the robot to go somewhere, and so we can actually display those commands um, in virtual reality basically anticipating where the robot's going to go. And that really, really helps with um, uh, not making mistakes and basically pretend, basically allowing the surgeon to feel like they're operating in real time, even though they're operating at a far distance. And we can we can simulate these distances in our labs. Now, something else that was uh, brought up is this idea of uh, lack of haptic feedback. And something that you can do is uh, once you have a good representation of the geometry of the scene, you can actually just look at uh, how the tissues are stretching and moving around, and you can get a rough sense of how much forces you're applying to them. Um, and this is what you would normally do, uh, you know, in your, uh, this is what you'd be trained to do, you know, as a surgeon, but now we can explicitly kind of define, quanti uh, quantify these things purely from the pixel images. Now, the underlying technology I'll kind of get to a little bit later, but this is just to give you an idea of what we can do um, right now and what we've done in our lab. Now, one of the things uh, we can do, let's say you don't have a robot. Um, this is this is how the technology basically um, builds out from uh, and expands just uh, beyond the robotic case, which is we can take all of these uh, visual cues, we can take our ability to draw augmented reality um, annotations, and we can apply them to cooperative uh, surgeries. Um, and, and so where, let's say an expert is looking in on the um, operation and they have the ability to draw in real time uh, and in 3D. So let's say this view, for example, this would be the view of a, a expert that has a VR headset on and um, they're looking at the uh, operating table which has been reconstructed in 3D for them. And they can select different views and um, and also draw on them and you know annotate where things should go. And so you can see right now there is a remote user, a novice, let's say, that doesn't know, you know, how to um, uh, access uh, you know, a radially a radially access uh, um, uh, for, for the for the patient. So so these uh, types of visualizations and um, registrations are extremely useful, uh, even if you don't have a robot. Now, you know, we, we we often think about, you know, the edge cases too in our research lab. So we talked about having a remote surgeon, but no robot. Well, let's talk about having a remote robot, but no surgeon. So here's a case where let's say you lose communication. Uh, you're doing telesurgery. Uh, maybe this is um, in the future. This might be a case where it is uh, uh, a trauma procedure where somebody has hemorrhaging and you're trying to stabilize them, and for some reason communication breaks off, which is a real situation, especially in you know uh, um, cases of natural disaster or cases of like uh, conflict and uh, battle fields and things like that. So we can use our understanding of uh, the scene and we can uh, basically have the robot recognize where the blood is and uh, recognize foreign objects, go and grasp those objects in real time and, and operate basically independently, at least in very simple tasks like, you know, suctioning blood and picking up uh, objects. Now we can get a little bit closer to um, hitting on the intelligence side of um, um, the the robot where we're trying to bake in what is learned uh, during medical school or, or you know practice which is you know in this case we're learning how to optimally grasp a suture oftentimes you know when you first learn to throw sutures uh, at least um, certainly in laparoscopic surgery but also you know with the da vinci robot um, you have to learn the best place to grasp needles because then throwing the suture, um, you don't have a problem with wrist mobility. So this is a, a way that we have a robot learn from surgeons automatically um, after the surgeon provides a few examples how to grasp um, uh, optimally uh, the, the suture needles. 
Now, these are just examples of what we can do. And all of this is based on basically um, vision. And so that's one area that has, I, I would say that our research lab is uh, um, really pushing hard on. And I think we've made some significant gains in um, the past few years. And so when I say perception, I'm talking about reasoning about the 3D geometry of the scene, understanding the underlying physics, understanding uh, the uh, tissue, um, not written here though, is, but also understanding the tools and uh, instruments that the surgeon are using, tracking their mo movements, things like that. Now, um, this is obviously a challenging uh, task uh, from a technical perspective, uh, but it's also pretty obvious that these videos are not easy to understand. Um, there's often significant occlusion. Um, there's narrow fields of view. Um, depth perception is pretty bad because your uh, vision is uh, tied to how wide of a camera baseline between like a, a stereo camera you can have. So your you know, like left, right eye depth perception is um, not great. There's a lot of specular reflection, smoke, um, obscuring blood, which really makes it challenging to get an understanding of and a very accurate depiction of 3D, um, uh, of the 3D scene. So um, one of the major works that we've done in our lab is to um, address this problem. And this is a multifaceted problem. And this is something that we've done in a framework called SUPER, which is for surgical perception. So in this SUPER framework, uh, we're trying to do instrument tracking, which you see on the bottom left. So we know exactly where your instruments are relative to um, the tissues you're interacting with. We're trying to do tissue reconstruction, uh, which you can see um, basically on the top right. And in addition to tissue reconstruction, we can also do fusion. So um, the fusion aspect, um, you can probably see it in the bottom, right? Um, but that, that, the idea is that um, as you move uh, tissues around um, and as you move the camera around, you're seeing different viewpoints that get around occlusions and get around those um, points where you know you have lack of visibility. And so that can help you um, plan better. It can help you see things that aren't immediately like in your uh, in the camera's field of view. Um, and it lets us basically uh, get a sense of, you know, the whole geometry and the the, the um, mechanics of the tissue that's being interacted with. Now, one of the hardest tasks here is to really, really pinpoint um, where your instruments are in space. And so we do uh, basically a bunch, uh, 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 we have uh, several techniques and they're basically all fused together um, that range from classical computer vision to deep learning based methods. Uh, but one of the things that we can do now is um, basically track instruments with very, very high degree of fidelity. Uh, you can even see in situations where uh, in the top right, um, the, the camera is moving while the instrument is moving. Um, and, and so, and, and there's significant movement as well. So uh, actually not this video, sorry, not, not the top right. This video will be where it um, has both camera movement and instrument movement. Well, it's not, Okay, it's not playing for me right now, but uh, basically you can see that the instrument tracking um, um, here works quite well. Um, actually, this there is camera movement here. So, so this is really important because um, this is how we translate it, not only from you know the standard Da Vinci um, setup where the camera you kind of have to latch into the camera and unlatch then move your instruments, but we can now. Uh, use this type of uh, reconstruction and tracking uh, in cooperative surgeries where you know there's a camera holder and also somebody else doing the, the um, tissue manipulation. Um, now, another thing that is obviously very important is uh, not only 3D reconstruction, but understanding the mechanics of tissue. Once you understand the mechanics of tissue, then you can start um, understanding what's going on underneath the tissue. You can start estimating where uh, uh, lesions and things have moved given surface deformations that you're uh, generating from your instruments. So in this case, we can solve for that using um, something called position-based dynamic simulation. And the key is uh, of this work is that we are constantly matching 
Uh, we're constantly looking at what's happening in the scene and we're re-registering every few frames. And by doing that, we make sure that whatever we are believing the scene to have in terms of uh, stiffness, like in terms of uh, how the tissue st should deform, we're constantly correcting for it. Um, and that way we can actually uh, get a better and better estimation of how things move. Um, now, uh, I mentioned that uh, blood, you know, uh, is something that we work on and it is a large aspect of uh, what you have to handle when you look at, you know, bringing intelligence into the scene. So um, we have uh, a lot, a decent amount of work in tracking blood and also, you know, estimating the location of bleeding, which can sometimes, you know, happen where, you know, you're trying to search for a bleed and didn't occur like immediately in your field of view. Now, one of the big cases we're moving towards is uh, trying to basically distinguish tissues from each other. And this is a grand challenge, I'd say, in um, uh, intelligence when it relates to uh, perception in surgery. And so obviously if we can distinguish anatomical features um, uh, within uh, endoscopic video, then we can really um, provide recommendations and uh, of like where to avoid, we can suggest plans on how to get to certain anatomies. Um, yeah, just highlight places that are uh, key features, uh, yeah, either that you will go to or that you want to be careful of. And so just to give you a um, uh, high level uh, look, there's a lot that goes on to make this work. Um, and we call it semantic super, semantic being the fact that you can now label the classes of um, tissues that you see in the in the endoscopic scene. Uh, but you can see basically in the in the bottom uh, side, uh, bottom area of this uh, pipeline is that we have to basically pick uh, determine class labels, um, like what what every pixel in uh, endoscopic scene is, and convert that um, into uh, into a three D map. And as we build uh, more of these uh, um, as we build out our understanding of the scene, we can start reconstruction of certain anatomical features in three D um, individually and basically. Uh, get a better representation of each individual anatomical feature. Okay, so I only have a few minutes left, um, but uh, I want to talk about another uh, two things that um, we're working on in the lab. Uh, this is a really important problem, practically speaking. It's like, how do you set up your robot uh, for a procedure? And this is a very big question for every you know surgical robotics uh, practitioner and also company out there. And it can take up to 30 minutes to pick, you know, um, a, a good position because every patient is different uh, and, and every uh, approach can be different. <clears throat> so our goal is to do this in a metric driven way. And we can basically use machine learning and uh, a simulation to do this. We look at the idea of colliding, um, instruments colliding with themselves. We look at collisions between the robot and things outside of uh, the robot, like so it's approximate work space. And then we look at how much mobility it has inside the body. So that's where we want to maximize our workspace inside the body. And by using basically sample-based methods and machine learning, we can build these um, uh, maps of how well you can reach certain areas, given that you have you know, a trade-off in self-collisions. And we can provide composite scores that tell you, okay, if you're entering into a procedure with this anatomy, you need to position, you can position your robot in this general area where the heat map is good, right? Um, versus, you know, other areas where you have a uh, bad reachability in the body or you constantly are hitting yourself outside of the body. Um, and, and this can happen um, all in basically near instant, um, in instantaneously, despite the fact that you really have a lot of flexibility when setting up the uh, the arms, and and that's basically the innovation that we were kind of pushing towards. Number one, the the description of this problem mathematically, so that we have metrics to drive positioning the the um, uh, setting up the robot, but um, also to provide it in a near instant uh, um, rate, so that so that uh, um, you can do it on the fly in the operating room. <clears throat> so, so you know, we have some simple examples of uh, uh, 
you know, a bench top scenario, just as a, just to give you a visualization, like this is what you would see, like poor collision scores would mean that the robot will constantly be colliding. Poor reachability would mean like a robot arm is just not, it's overextended or it's going to constantly um, uh, be, be hitting a, a limit in terms of where it can uh, reach. So um, the final, uh, one of the final things I want to uh, bring up is uh, we also uh, consider um, the image guidance from uh, medical um, uh, imaging systems like CT and MRI. Uh, and, and we look at how we can leverage our understanding of where we need to access to build robots that can um, have the dexterity to access them. So, so in this case, we we examined uh, a lot of cases from UCSD, and we looked at how uh, needles were getting inserted. And ultimately, uh, we can build a robot that um, that can be designed to uh, fit the imaging bores and provide that kind of dexterity. So, this is a final um, video um, I'll show, and it is a robot that we built that. Um, provides basically the uh, da Vinci-like dexterity in the imaging bore, um, but with that kind of long and um, laparoscopic kind of design that gets you in there with a lot of space to reach around and hit. And like I said, these are all based on clinical cases of where um, uh, the interventional radiologists were hitting um, uh, different lesions. And so we know that this is clinically viable and uh, and and translatable. Okay, so uh, thank you very much for um, listening. Um, and you know, there's more students that I can count to that have helped and collaborators that have helped on this project. And I'd be happy to take any questions. That was a very interesting talk. You cover a lot of applications there of robotic surgery, etc. Um, Dr. Lums, I believe you had a couple of questions. Yeah, so you covered very practical things like how do I set that robot up on a daily basis, which kind of is the basic stuff that drives people crazy, all the way through to showing, you know, the deformation of tissue. Now, we were just sitting here talking about it, is that it seems like you almost need to model the tensile strength of different tissues. I mean, fat's different from muscles, different from fascia, it's different from liver, for example. And, and so how do, you, how do you create that? Is it all just image-based, or is some of that you do in the lab and then you incorporate into your modeling? Yeah, so there's a spectrum here, right? So if you have a, a prior, so let's say you have a preoperative CT scan, right, you, and you have some segmentation related to that, um, you can bring um, part of that into uh, into the surgery, and it can start resolving certain parameters that you're interested in. So, per anatomical feature, you can be trying to determine what the uh, mm -hmm. stiffness of the characteristics of that tissue are. Now, you could also go in with very little understanding of what's happening, and it will try to tease out. You know, this section of the tissue is more stiff. Uh, versus this other section. Um, and, and hopefully, you know, one day when we bring in the semantic side, you know, we're trying to figure out what the classes of tissues are, um, then we can kind of uh, start uh, making those links to saying like, all right, well, you know, this is different because, you know, this is, you know, the, the um, connected tissue or this is softer because it is colon, you know. Uh, so so that, that's a spectrum that we can, we can uh, play with. So you touched on something that's, I'm a vascular surgeon, near and dear to our heart, is that we can see what we are operating on. What we really want to see is half a centimeter or a centimeter ahead of what we're operating on. And you kind of touched on that a little bit. I mean, are you starting to integrate preoperative CAT scans or preoperative imaging into helping the surgeon be a little more careful in what he's doing? Yeah, actually, the funny thing is that I didn't show this, but... If you recall, there was a video of haptic feedback, and we're trying to provide you um, a feeling of what you're touching. In fact, that haptic feedback is based on a pre-segmented liver model, where the vascular is actually also segmented. Right. And so 
in some ways actually skipped a step in between where you would actually be able to see what was underneath the tissue, at least from a preoperative um, uh, side of things. So uh, you would see a deformation happening on the pre-op scan. Now, how accurate that is depends on how often you update your image, which is why we focus so much in our lab on making sure every you know interaction of uh, the surface of the tissue, cool. we're trying to update our understanding of um, what's happening underneath the tissue. Right. And so um, creating that tie is definitely non-trivial, uh, something people work on a lot, um, but but it's it's actually underneath the hood already. So let me ask one last question, and that is all of the talks we've heard today are based upon intuitive surgical robotics, which is if you're the CEO mm -hmm. of intuitive surgical, they've created this huge you know, research enterprise. How easy is it to translate this into other robots that are coming down the line? Yeah, there is, I would say at least, you know, I can't speak further, but I would say that there's almost no, uh, there's nothing specific to intuitive surgical here. To be honest, I would suspect one of the reasons why Intuitive is mentioned so often is that they actually have a research platform they provide mm -hmm. researchers. So, Smart. you know, for anybody that's watching that is a, a research team in, you know, a, 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 a competitor, you know, you should make your robots available to us researchers because, you know, then we can demonstrate it on your robots too. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Yep. It was a real pleasure having you on the show. I look forward to touch thank base you. with you again in the future. Um, our next guest. Dr. Farshid Alambiji. He is an assistant professor at the University of Texas at Austin Walker's Department for Mechanical Engineering in the Corkle School of Engineering. And now he directs the Advanced Robotic Technologies for Surgery Lab, or the Arts Lab, and with his robot focused, focused sorry, on developing high dexterity and situationally aware continuum manipulators, soft robotics and appropriate instruments, especially designed for less minimally invasive treatment of various medical applications. Um, the talk he's going to give us today, if he's online, is a robotic surgeon of spinal fixation procedures. Hello, everyone. Do you hear me? Coming in loud and clear. Awesome. So let me share my slide quickly. Do you see the slide now? Yes. Awesome. Um, Right. Hello everyone, I'm Farshid Alam Begi. Thanks so much for the introduction and thanks so much for inviting me for your great symposium. So today I'm going to talk about robotic surgery engineering of spinal fixation procedures. As uh, I got introduced, I'm an assistant professor in University of Texas at Austin and uh, I started my job in 2019. It's almost like uh, three years I'm in University of Texas. So I wanna start with introducing my uh, lab, Advanced Robotic Technologies for Surgery. In short, uh, in short, we call it Arts Lab. So in Arts Lab, in collaboration with different medical schools, actually UT, is one, uh, UT Delmet is one of them. We also collaborate with MD Anderson Cancer Center. Uh, we try to develop, or ba basically we call it surgery near, the uh, basically surgery. In, and the, in short, the meaning is that engineering the surgery. And the goal is to basically partner intelligent robots and mainly flexible robots with surgeons with the goal of elevating the quality of the surgery and hopefully increasing the uh, patient outcome, surgical outcome, and improving the safety of uh, the surgery. So you see in the bottom, the video of my lab, actually, I got lucky a professional team came to my lab, got this nice video of the equipment that we have in the lab. As you see, we have a C-arm, we have a fully a full Da Vinci system. As Mike was talking about, thanks to Intuitive Surgical, I have this research kit as well in my lab for doing different kind of uh, basically surgical research. Especially with Da Vinci Robot, we do uh, different research, like uh, I'm sure Mike was talking about surgical autonomy. We do also as well a little bit about uh, research about surgical autonomy. Also, what I do in my lab, uh, uh, my background is mechanical engineering. We do different uh, sort of research from biomechanical, uh, basically research to design and development of different flexible implants, flexible robots. Uh, development of uh, control algorithms and machine learning algorithms for different sort of, uh, let's say, medical applications. I use the word engineering. I wanted to actually uh, have this slide 
to somehow define it. So for any surgical intervention, uh, we can actually divide it to three different modules. The very first module is like physician working with the medical device or medical robot, or we can call it technology. And this technology, as you see on the right, uh, basically box can be a robot, can be like even a medical device, medical imaging modality or anything, literally. And the other and the third part of this triangle is information. So in total, physician, technology, and information, they need to work together effectively and basically robustly to have a successful, let's say, intervention. And by surgeon engineering, we want to bridge the uh, current gap between the surgeons and engineers. Like a classical engineering, what we had so far is that a clinician comes and says, okay, we have this need. We need basic surgical need. We need a new device. We need a new algorithm or software to do this. And then engineers were going to their lab trying to develop that basically technology. But the issue is that as an engineer, we don't have the, like the depth of knowledge of a surgeon or clinician to completely understand the problem. And unfortunately, what happens most of the time, you develop a nice technology from a technological perspective, engineering perspective, but it's not basically translatable. But the cool thing with surgeon engineering is that you want to work with the surgeon along the path and develop basically a technology that's hopefully going to be translated to the operating room and being used uh, by uh, clinicians and end users. So I always start my talk with this nice actually uh, graph. It's from a paper from 2012, but still I say it's valid. I just changed a little bit of that. So x-axis is the years of the big milestones in terms of technological development in the realm of surgery it started, as you see, with open surgery, minimal invasive surgery. And of course, in 1990, with the uh, intuitive surgical and Da Vinci uh, robot, we basically got introduced to the realm of robotic surgery. And you see videos of the uh, very first versions or second versions of the Da Vinci surgical robot. The main reason is that actually we wanted to make patients and surgeons both happy in terms of uh, basically providing them the dexterity and precision while doing minimal invasive surgery and also faster recovery, smaller incision for the surgeon. As you see, the, I mean, the main goal of the tools was to providing the surgeons uh, with the, while they are doing the tele uh, telesurgery, the dexterity of an open surgery. They can feel their hands are inside the uh, uh, patient's body while they are doing precisely the surgery that they are intended to do. So, the next milestone, which is, uh, I can say, like for the last 20 years, many researchers are working on development of uh, basically different types of flexible instruments or robots. Flexible instruments like catheters and different type of robots that instead of uh, basically to provide, again, minimal invasive surgery and also transluminal, uh, basically endoscopic surgery or no invasion surgery. And the goal here was can we get in? through the body, through natural orifices, or very small incisions and provide surgeons with more dexterity. Instead of using rigid, basically, instruments and robots that minimize the access of the surgeons into the body, can be developed tools that can select and bend into the body, can we control them effectively to help them to reach to the area they want in a minimally invasive fashion. So we call this, like from a technological perspective, engineering perspective, this type of devices, continuum manipulators, continuum robots, and I have an example here of different type of robots in terms of degrees of freedom, how flexible they are. So on top, you, I'm sure most of people have seen rigid link manipulators, like uh, automation of the industry, 1900, 1950 plus up to like 2000. This type of robots have helped a lot in industry. And then we have a stick like robot, hyper redundant manipulators, and finally continuum manipulators. The difference here is that we don't have any joint in the body of the robot. And then the whole body flexes like catheters. So two examples of uh, this kind of uh, flexible access surgery or continuum robots that already have been commercialized. You see on top right, intuitive surgical SP robot, single port robot that I think recently got FDA approval. And the idea here was that instead of having multiple ports for uh, minimal invasive surgery, you get in from one port and then open up like a snake and increase the activity with multiple flexible tools for the surgeons. 
what I mean is the basically the monarch platform for biopsy of the launch. Uh, the CDO is for our uh, basically company and got acquired by Johnson and Johnson J and J actually like two three years ago. And the goal here was this is another example of a flexible robot or continuum catheter that can go in and a surgeon can use a joystick to control the catheter, go to the places they want, and then do the uh, manual biopsy. I had these slides to get into this important point. So continuum manipulators, flexible instruments or flexible access surgery have been mostly used if you check like the literature and also uh, if you check the commercialized uh, equipment, robots, and devices, mostly for soft tissue related surgeries or surgeries dealing with a deformable tissue. But if you check, there is not such a robot or device as developed for orthopedic intervention. And the answer kind of is easy. So if you are using a flexible device or robot interacting with a hard tissue, what happens? So if you want to cut a hard tissue like a bone or drill through the bone, there are like a, a lot of external forces causing the body to deform or buckle and not deliver actually the forces to do the task intended for. So to address actually this issue, uh, that's the focus of my lab. Basically, we are trying to develop both dexterous and autonomous uh, robots and devices that can basically perform different types of surgery either like soft tissue related surgeries or heart tissue related surgeries in a dexterous and intelligent way. And what is nice in this plot is that I have four quadrants on this basically uh, plot. X axis is dexterity, Y axis is autonomy. If I wanna actually summarize the whole technology developed so far in the literature, in the research domain and commercialized domain, you can actually uh, see it in this plot. So on the top left actually quadrant, we have heart tissue related orthopedic or neurosurgery related technologies. We see in terms of dexterity, meaning that developing tools that are, that can increase the dexterity of the surgeons in a minimal evasive way, they are very poor. But in terms of autonomy, they are good because let's say cutting a bone is similar to basically cutting a piece of wood or metal because you can pre-plan and command the robot to go and machine it in a, uh, basically in a precise way. But in terms of the extractive that they are poor. On the other hand, actually, we have soft tissue related surgery. So as I showed you a few examples, I can say you are good in terms of the extractive. There are different, uh, basically, technologies already commercialized to do this kind of surgeries, but they are very hard in terms of autonomy. I'm sure Mike was talked a lot about the challenges regarding bringing autonomy on soft tissue uh, related surgeries. And as I said, the goal of my lab is that can be in the top right quadrant, the ideal quadrant, can we develop algorithms and designs and hardware solutions to make both autonomous and dexterous uh, devices independent of the type of surgery. So the focus of today's talk, I want to talk about uh, basically surgery engineering of the spinal fixation, especially for osteoporotic patients. So I want to start with osteoporosis. As you are very well familiar, osteoporosis means the reduce in the decrease in the bone mineral density up to two and a half basic standard deviation below the healthy population. And there are actually, this is a very big concern for the, uh, for the board. As you see, one in every two women and one in every four men over the age of 50, unfortunately, they are dealing with osteoporosis. More than like about hundred billions of dollars every year is basically across the board are spent on osteoporosis, and you can see other statistics regarding this important issue. So the talk is about the spinal fixation, and the technology that I'm developing in my lab is regarding helping this the spinal fixation with the focus of osteoporotic patients. So as you are very well familiar, or if you are not familiar. For the spinal column, most of the surgery, the surgeons want to do a surgery. In the end, they typically use a screws like this. They call it pedicular screw and try to fixate it, fixate different uh, levels of vertebra together with this rod in order to bring a stability, reduce the uh, basically pain for patients and hopefully after a few months uh, getting the recovery for the patient. But the issue is that so we are dealing with an anatomy which is super complex in terms of geometry, in terms of different actually nerves and vessels, 
uh, going around the anatomy, and then which makes actually placement of this rigid screws in, inside the body very hard and very challenging. So you are using a rigid screw, a very small tunnel here that we call it pedicle, and surgeons need to go through this pedicle and then precisely implant that screw inside the vertebral body, this part of the vertebra. But the issue is that you can imagine, if as can be seen actually in the CT scan, this part of the basic vertebral body is osteoporotic, means that the density of the vertebra at this point is like lower than the normal part of the vertebral body. What happens? It's like basically you go to camping, you put your nails to fixate the tent inside the soil. So if you put a screw inside an osteoporotic region, statistics, data shows, research shows that no matter what, 100% this fixation is going to fail. Why? And there are two different mechanisms for that because of a screw loosening. So the screw is going to get loosened and then pulled out, uh, basically out of an osteoporotic uh, uh, bone. And what they're suggesting, we say, what if, like this uh, conceptual picture, map the bone density through the vertebra and then find the regions. Here we are showing with dark, actual red color. Uh, map that, and instead of going straight to the bone, we can create a curved tunnel and flexible screw and fixate our screw in a hard part of the bone. And then, so intuitively, it means that actually, if it's uh, fixated into the harder bone, the chance for a screw loosening and pull, pull out should be less. So that's the whole concept. And for that, we are building this image guided robotic platform for various neurosurgical applications. Why I say neurosurgical applications in the spinal domain? Because as I said, Almost all of them are using basically uh, this uh, fixation uh, uh, with uh, rigid screws. So if you see in this picture, I have a C-arm, the envisioned uh, platform. I have a C-arm, we have this robotic manipulator. And the core of that is using a continuum manipulator, flexible manipulator, as our steerable drilling robot. So our steerable drilling robot means that I can get in, I can control the curvature of the robot and create curved tunnels rather than rigid and straight tunnels and using flexible screws that I'm going to talk about it. So if you have a curved tunnel, then you, ha you cannot use rigid screws, so you have to use flexible screws. So this research has different actually components to it. Starts with biomechanics and point element analysis, I'm going to talk about it. Design, modeling, and fabrication of a steerable drilling robot. Robots that are uh, giving you the ability to intuitively, safety, and uh, time efficiently create curved tunnels into the vertebral body without failure, without buckling. Design of sensors and optical fibers to give you the information where you are and different control algorithms. And of course, the core is flexible, uh, basically, implant that can morph into the curved uh, trajectory and create enough stability for the uh, body. So as I said, the R technology and basically approach is start with the biomechanical analysis. So we, this is a real uh, quantitative CT scan of a patient that we got from a Dell Medical School. What is the difference between quantitative CT scans and CT scans is using this calibration phantom. So as you see in this picture, we put this under the back of the patients while they are going through the normal CT scans. And what it gives us after that, we can map pretty much the bone density into the vertebral body. So we can say which part of the bone, like in this here, at this basic, this part in this picture is osteoporotic or not. And with that, what we can do, we can go through or fine element analysis and design some trajectories like this. Instead of going straight, we can say, okay, I can have this curved trajectory. And you see, this is the cross section of a real patient. The bone density, different colors means different densities. And then we say, okay, I, if I have a curved screw like this implanted into the body, what happens to the stress distribution? And uh, we have shown actually, instead of using a rigid screw, if you have a curved screw implanted into the body, we can reduce three times the maximum stress and a strain to the body, which is the main reason for that screw loosening that I was talking about, the failure of the implant. So after all biomechanical analysis, the core is, as you see in this picture, typically uh, surgeons are using a rigid drill to go through and make this basically straight trajectory. But if we wanna make 
that trajectory obtained from our biomechanical analysis, we need to develop a continuum robot or flexible robot, something, a trivial drilling robot that enables us to go through and make this uh, basically uh, curved trajectories without any bug playing, without any basically adding uh, some time to the patient's uh, surgical intervention. So this is, these videos are the work that I did back in Johns Hopkins during my PhD. We developed this uh, the concept of curved drilling for heart tissue, as you see, this is a continuum robot, selective robot with some notches that with control of cables, we could somehow control the curvature of the basic the drilling tunnel. So we also did back in Hopkins, tested on uh, basically human cadavers on a femur to show that under the X-ray, fully autonomous, we can go through and then make curved trajectories. But there was an issue with this technology because the control of the robot inside the uh, body was super hard. So it was super slow, taking like 10 minutes to just like drill like a two centimeter hole. Instead to address those technologies, we came up with this new idea of using kind of uh, basically some pre-shaped uh, uh, nitinol or super elastic uh, shape memory alloys to create curve tunnels. And the idea is that if I have the trajectory, coming from biomechanics, I can shape like nitinol tubes, super elastic tubes to the trajectory that I want. And if I pass flexible cutting drills and shafts through these basically canola, and then I don't need to then control that. I can create nice curved tunnels that pre-shape and pre-control, pre-programmed to go through the uh, trajectories that I want to, and then make nice tunnels. So this is the very first generations of our uh, setup that we made. So if you see here, the idea is very uh, simple. So these are super elastic nitinol tubes. You can shape them to the trajectory that you want. If you pass them through a rigid uh, tube and push them out, they gradually get the shape that we have programmed for. And since inside those, we have a drill bit rotating. So you can imagine that you push this in and the drill bit is rotating so we can create tunnels that you would like to see. So. Here in the video, this is showing the outside view of our drill pushing into, and this is actually showing the thermal camera view from outside. By the time we didn't have X-ray, you wanted to see what's happening inside. Since during cutting, we generate heat, we could see the trace of the heat, which is showing actually we can go through curve trajectory. So after doing this experiment to show that what was the cross section of the cut, and by the way, these are simulated bone material, saw bone samples. We wanted to test our uh, basic system with. So we did different curve trajectories, repetitions. We showed that actually in 15 seconds, rather than 10 minutes, very similar to the current operations, we can create very nice and smooth trajectories for implantation of our screws. And this is actually we put a very tiny endoscope inside the tunnel to check the quality of the basic the tunnel. And this is the, the test that we did. We call it actually multi-branch cutting. You go from one hole, you then make different tunnels for various applications. This is good. So instead of just cutting a, a big hole inside the bone and compromising stay, uh, healthy and bad tissue, you can just get in from one hole and then bend for different trajectory to reach. And then we did actually different tests on uh, animal bones as well to show that the efficacy of our work. By the time we got our X-ray, this is the X-ray view. Not only we are able to drill in curved trajectories into the heart tissue, look at the middle one. I really like this one. This is our recent uh, research. We can even go from one hole, go from a U shape and then come out from another hole. If you look at the anatomy of a spine, you can imagine going from one pedicle and then getting out from the other one. And if you can have an implant that can go through this U shape, you can completely fixate the vertebra and completely uh, actually remove the all the issues of loosening. It's the next generation we recently built in our lab. So for creating, this is two degree of freedom. You can get in and you can rotate. And this is our setup. Uh, what we can do with this, now we can get in and rotate and then create like some cavity. So instead of just drilling, now we are able to create cavities and tunnels inside. They were super useful for cancer, bone cancer. Imagine you go from pedicle inside and it start to rotate and remove, excise the, basically the bone, the tumor, and then come back from a tiny hole. And this is basically a sample uh, uh, geometry that we cut with our, uh, basically our robot 
we went in, we started to rotate and we are able, and this is actually the geometry of the cut material that we made. This is a laser scanner actually showing how we can do it. These are different examples of the cuts that we can have. Like these are the branch cutting. You go from one hole and then the branch out, or you can create this like half geometry. Imagine this is the geometry of the cancer. You go there and then you want to completely excise it. So with this robot, we can pretty much do it. So I talked about biomechanics, how to create trajectory. I talked about the robot that can create that tunnel. And then we need to talk about flexible pedicular screws. As I said, what we are using currently is a rigid screw, but we, we are able, we have designed uh, screws that can curve in and then create this nice, actually uh, follow these nice trajectories and create a stability as we predicted with point element analysis. So we call it flexible pedicular screw. As you see, this is the conceptual design. This is half rigid, half flexible pedicular screw. Why half rigid? Because this part of the screw, no matter what, because of anatomy, is a straight trajectory. So you don't need to make it flexible. And the rest of that is flexible because if you have a flexible trajectory, we, we need it to make it flexible. It's cannulated so we can pass inject bone cement through, pass different sensors or anything if it's needed through that. And it's actually self-tapping. So it can create its own thread and tap, uh, thread uh, during the insertion. So we did different fine element analysis in terms of stability to make sure during the insertion, during TAP, it doesn't fail and also it can uh, create a stability. So here is the very first generation that we 3D printed with metal and SLS actually approached. Hey, Farshid, so this is just on a the polite bit. reminder, uh, we've got to wrap it up and um, for respect sure. of the time of our guests. Thank you. Last slide. This is last slide. Sorry. So here is basically the video of the insertion of these screws into the, uh, basically under the X-ray showing that if I have a curved trajectory, it can go through. And then here is actually the POV view that we had a small, uh, basically endoscope through the screw to show actually if you have a tunnel, what happens during the uh, insertion. So thanks so much for the NIH for supporting our grant and then our collaborators. And thanks so much for your attention. Sorry, I passed the time. Thank you. Uh, yeah, really good talk there. Um, I believe Dr. Lumsden has got a comment. Yeah, I, so a comment, uh, two comments actually. Number one is, how do you set up your clinical collaborations? You've, you've covered a huge spectrum here. So we're really interested in how you do it because that's what we're struggling with. Um, and then yes. we're, we're going to offer our <laughs> services. If you really need yeah. collaborators, we're, we're here to help. Look, but that, that's the good thing that I'm hearing because typically we think as an engineer, as engineers, that it's very hard to find clinical collaborators. I didn't know that you have the same issue too. So for me as a faculty, it, the hardest part is that finding collaborators who are willing to do research. Great. Because most of the time we know that you are very busy and then we did uh, basically new technologies similar to engineers is going to do surgery engineering, we need to basically work with you guys yeah. a lot I think of we, time, we have do one, a lot of brain Again, interested times, one last question. Yeah, so we're also, and we, we're probably going to invite you to come and speak at this, run this meeting we call sure. Pumps and Pipes, which is the interface between the cardiovascular world and oil and gas. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that they, they present is directional drilling, which is basically what you are doing. And I've always, it's always driven me crazy that we've not been able to do that. You, that's what you just described, mm -hmm. is subsurface drilling using through calcium, the, the bones, and the, that we're very interested in how you, how you control the navigation and how you control the direction. That's probably too much for us to go into at the moment, but we're going to reach out <laughs> to you offline and for come sure, and participate yeah. in Pumps and Pipes and tell us how you've implemented this. <clears throat> Very exciting. Of course, we would be very happy. Thank you. I appreciate yeah. that. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you for your time. Um, and we're going to go straight thank on you. now to the next talk we have. We're, we're kind of bringing in now, actually, into here at Houston Methodist, kind of what we've got going on here or some of the projects just to highlight. So now we have Dr. Galab Abassi, uh, Sunny Bagtan, Jose Manuel Colados. Um, Dr. Abassi is System Director, Pharmacy Informatics at Houston Methodist. And Dr. Bagtan is System Director of Pharmacy Informatics um, at Houston Meth. I think. There's a bit of a change there, sorry. Um, um, so, the, you know, we actually met with Chima, uh, who's uh, Jose Manuel Colades from ABB Robotics. And they're here with the, the TMC Innovation Center to integrate their ABB Robotics platform into medicine. And, you know, Mirren teamed up with Homer Kitana about two and a half years ago, the Center for Rapid Device Translation. And we're saying, right, you know, how can we help ABB Robotics 
um, find a need or find a problem here, Houston Methodist. So we've been working diligently behind the scenes and in the form of Dr. Um, Abassi, Dr. Bagta, I think we, we hit a real nail on the head there with a the need that, that these guys are having. So we're going to talk about that now. Uh, Dr. Abassi, over to you, sir. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Stuart. This is Gail Abassi, Assistant Director of uh, Pharmacy Informatics at uh, Houston Methodist. And uh, I'm, I'm Sonny Bakta. I'm one of the pharmacy operations managers at Houston Methodist Hospital um, here in the medical center. Yeah, I'm Jose Manuel Colados, Jose Manuel Colados. I'm a uh, business responsible for life science and healthcare within ABB Robotics. And uh, we started this business with an accelerator in Houston, so very close to Houston Methodist. I'm very happy to be here. Thank you very much. All right, Shima, let's uh, move forward to the next slide, please, and uh, you can take it. All right, here we go. So um, just a brief intro about Houston, uh, Houston Methodist, and uh, I'm sure like, uh, this part has been discussed several times for some of you over here, but we are an eight hospital system and close to, uh, you know, over 2,500 beds uh, across the Houston metro area. One of the major um, health systems that you can see in the country um, on the best uh, hospitals um, on the US world, the news report uh, uh, renewed again this year. Uh, we are continuously in the uh, higher 10 or 20 uh, in different specialties across the uh, United States uh, as well. And we're also leaders in the innovation. As you can see, we're very well spread across the uh, Houston metro area. And uh, what we'd like to show you today is something that uh, has been worked on in the uh, flagship hospital, which is the uh, uh, Houston Methodist Hospital in the Texas Medical Center. Next slide. Yeah, and I can quickly introduce also ABB. So we are a, a global company, a large industrial uh, company that is basically working on for uh, business, electrification, motion, process automation, and robotics. And our core is really work and support our customers for energy efficiency with electrification products and motors, rice, uh, that uh, can use the, uh, pro support uh, our customers use the energy in the best possible way, but also support in industrial processes and automation. So, and we are, as you know, ABB Robotics, we are starting a venture in life science and healthcare here from Houston. And if we look into what we are going to present today and at very high level of how it connects to what we are doing in ABB, we are really looking into the overall workflow on pharma manufacturing to patients. And we had a lot of experience for years in manufacturing. This is where robots have been utilized traditionally, manufacturing, quality control, but we see a very strong potential to support in other areas like we are very strongly working here in the laboratory automation, research labs, but we will be talking today about the workflow and the supply chains within hospitals. So we are talking about the distribution centers, pharmacies, intralogistic and, and fulfillment centers within hospitals. And one very important part for this is really pharmacy and center of pharmacy. Thanks, Jose. Uh, I'll uh, try to explain, uh, you know, kind of what, happens within our four walls in terms of a pharmacy service, um, you know, from a perspective of an academic medical center, but like Caleb mentioned and a couple of slides back, you know, this, this is kind of replicated to some degree um, in every hospital in our system, which, you know, there's seven other hospitals that, that provide pharmacy services. Um, so within these four walls, I want to kind of use an analogy that's, you know, like an airport, right? Um, you have inbound traffic and you have outbound traffic. Um, but through the whole process, it's like air traffic control here in the middle. And you're going to see how complex it gets when we start dealing with vendors, suppliers, supply chain, and then moving product within our four walls. Um, and, you know, just getting the product to our end destination. So the things outside of that central pharmacy, um, you know, point of care dispensing cabinets, point of care nursing units, OR suites, um, crash cards, um, and then our, our bigger service areas, our IV rooms, um, our satellite pharmacies, which on this campus we have nine, um, and then our hospital network, which we, we talked about a little bit earlier, um, is seven across the metro area. Um, and then we have our investigational drug services and clinical trials where we also supply um, drug uh, product to. So 
um, you know, the, the life cycle of a medication um, and product um, is very complex, um, but we're hoping to leverage some robotics and automation to augment that workflow over time. Um, today, we'll see some parts of the process that we've automated and some parts that are semi-automated. Um, so, um, Jose, if you want to kind of just kind of start off, start us off here. We have a big part um, of our operation is receiving from our wholesalers, manufacturers, um, pharma manufacturers directly, um, and then um, other specialty sources of medication. From there, we kind of take it, you know, in a bifurcated path here, and uh, um, we take a drug product and we will prepack into unit doses, which we've applied some um, robotic automation to support, um, whether it's, um, you know, through a, a high-speed packaging operation or a packaging and storage um, solution. Uh, so we do a lot of unit dosing. So the products that you're receiving, nursing, nursing staff are receiving, physicians are receiving, are in the unit of use for the most part. Um, and then we have a, a, a storeroom where there's also a strong potential. And, um, you know, uh, you know, Galeb will allude to kind of what the, the opportunities are um, in the next slide. But I just want to take you through the life cycle of the medication use process to give kind of a primer of where we're at today. Um, next slide. Uh, next, uh, um, Chima. Um, so from there, we go to replenishment and transfer. Um, replenishment and transfer uh, is a very complex process um, where we will take um, inventory and um, store it in an automated digitally tracked um, uh, inventory location. So in here, we have three different locations. Uh, carousel inventory, which is, uh, you know, a 28 level carousel, which is kind of um, you know, on a reinforced floor. So you may see only a small window of opening of a, about four feet, um, but you won't realize that there's 28 levels of medications there. So it allows us to do some high density storage and retrieval. Um, our dispensing robot uses pneumatics um, to help support um, packaging and um, picking operations for our staff. Um, so when we run a census of close to 800, 900 patients, um, this robot, you know, covers a good, uh, uh, you know, fraction of kind of our dispensing workload. Um, and then we have our C2 safe, which is our, our narcotic vault. Um, so we use um, um, some digital inventory uh, control methods there as well. Um, and then from here, we get a little bit more complicated um, order preparation. So this is where we do sterile, non-sterile compounding, um, unit of use distribution, packaging, labeling, um, for use by the end users. So our physicians, nurses, and then ultimate consumers are our patients. Um, so order preparation is a very, um, you know, complex process that we apply a lot of quality control measures to, um, but automation supports us in achieving our goals for high quality and resilient operations. So that's where we're looking to kind of um, further enhance some automation and um, robotic support through the process. A lot of processes are manual, um, so we're looking for ways to, you know, where we where are we going to invest in robotics and automation? Um, next, you'll see kind of the 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 last layer of complexity um, that the bi-directional transfer of, uh, of inventory, product movement um, throughout the hospital enterprise. Um, you'll see stuff going from um, that uh, that location of order preparation all the way to IV rooms and back um, after a complete product is done. Um, you'll see products ending up at our hospital network, um, uh, hospitals, investigational drugs. And then ultimately on our local campus, you'll see that in our dispensing cabinets, readily available at the right time and the right place. It's like a flight that's not delayed um, at the end of the day. That's what we're trying to achieve here. Um, and then most importantly, um, we do have um, a strong need um, to ensure that we have, uh, you know, a closed loop medication distribution process. So we know discharges happen. We know orders get changed. We know there's multiple factors in the care of a patient. Um, so when medications are unused, we need a strong pathway to ensure those are returned into circulation um, to create more of a, a, a resilient operation, drug availability, reduced uh, drug expense over time. Uh, we have to do these sorts of things to keep our operation very lean. So that's where we're also targeting um, a lot of automation. That's where we partnered with ABB to develop a, a pretty robust uh, solution here that um, I'm hopeful that we will get to see towards the end a, a prototype of what we're working on. Um, so I'll pass it over to my colleague, uh, Dr. Bossi, um, who will take it from here and kind of just share what the, the future looks like. All right. Thank you, Dr. Bakta. Um, so uh, and that was an overview of the uh, pharmacy automation, as you can see, um, in, a, in a central pharmacy, in a, in a matrix tertiary care center. Uh, in other hospitals, you may find different uh, workflows or different systems based on the size but this representation here is probably a good one for one of the most complex systems that you can you can see across the the country and the world of course um want to touch base on the uh, opportunities for for automation here um the reason why we're saying this is um we invest a lot in automation at houston methodist and 
the ones we're showing here are not exactly in the market. Those are the ones that we are trying to invent and trying to venture into. Um, some of them do exist to a certain degree, like the storeroom uh, replenishment over there or the storeroom organization. Uh, we're trying to incorporate something here at Houston Methodist where actually you can uh, better use this space and uh, hopefully automate it uh, in a way that you can, you can use the vertical aspect more than the horizontal. And this is something we're going to be looking into over the next uh, couple of months for sure, as well as the replenishment and transfer uh, you know, technologies and the order preps. Those ones would replace some manual work that the end users are doing today, meaning that whenever you receive uh, and prepack something in the storeroom or the pharmacy, then you're going to be looking at technology, robotics, in this case, and hardware to transfer that to the target uh, destination in this case, whether it's a C2 safe standing for controlled substance uh, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, protocol or safe to store these uh, medications or maybe to uh, take it to a dispensing robot where you're going to stock these medications and without the uh, need for a manual uh, process uh, or to the carousel storage and retrieval. Those technologies are, are crucial because right now these processes are literally manual uh, everywhere you go. Unless you're a very small hospital that you can just deal with only like receiving and just stocking, that can work. But in a matrix hospital, it's, it's just difficult to achieve without inserting some automation like this. And then with the order preparation, you're going to be looking at, again, like, you know, the transitioning between pharmacy dispensing and the point of care. You can see also there is a crash cart component at the uh, bottom right hand corner over there. Uh, the crash cards are systems that are used across the hospital for uh, the way how it sounds. Basically, a patient crashes and, you know, you just need to have medications right in one spot without the need to access automation in distant areas. You bring all these in a cart and start accessing those for patients. The process of restocking those cards, however, is a manual process. That's another one that we're trying to automate in this case as well. Uh, and you can see, you know, uh, everywhere we see a picture is a, is a, is a chance for automation uh, in this sense. The one we're gonna show you today as an example is the one that re relates to the returns management right on the middle top uh, of the screen. Next slide, uh, Chima. Yeah, and introducing, and thank you, Dr. Abasi, for showing all the opportunities for automation and improvement within the current workflow. We are working together with Methodists trying to bring the existing technology that has been developed also for other industries into the pharmacy. And the first example that you see there on the left is the flex buffer that we see a storage and retrieval system that can be used as a possible solution or alternative to current uh, systems using a storeroom, carousel storage, uh, dispensing robot, C2 safe. Uh, it's really a standard cell, a modular cell that offers performance and flexibility capable of supporting sequencing, stone, uh, storing and buffering. And the advantage well, is being a standard solution and having a robot in the center offers a better, best possible solution in terms of maintainability and uh, scalability and uh, standardization. The solution that you are seeing can uh, manage up to 600 boxes is one way, could weigh up to 50 kilograms with a cycle of 500 cycles per hour. And on the right, you see mobile robots. And of course, this is a, a, a trend and a reality already happening that will be able to transfer between the different spaces, order preparation, dispensing, nursing units, returns. Uh, and there are different types of solutions. So ABB has three lines. TOC is the, the solution of mobile robots that is pulling trolleys with a capability of up to 10 tons. Mover line would be the ones that is transporting goods, are capable of transporting between 15, uh, 50 and 150 kilograms, uh, oh, sorry, 1,500 1, kilograms, and also stacking mobile robots capable of uh, stacking boxes and acting as a for lift. And this will be our last slide to present to you before uh, and uh, myself and Dr. Bakta will take turns on this slide and then entertain your questions. But this is specifically the robot that we actually created from scratch, um, you know, working with ABB, of course, in this case. Uh, as you can see, this is the one that can be helping with the uh, return management um, uh, of the medications. Uh, this robot uh, works through the, um, you know, heat map mapping of whatever you have in that bucket over there, where it looks at certain aspects of what the content 
uh, creates a you know a suction by uh, by that tube that actually takes those uh, unit doses, and the right arm ends up scanning those um, uh, in order to sort them up later on in a later phase uh, in the same project. The goal is to uh, try to achieve uh, as much as 240 uh, doses an hour, uh, or quote, give or take. And then, of course, you know that would relieve hours and hours of, of technician work that ends up being just doing the exact process just in a manual way. So uh, we're looking to implement this uh, in uh, Houston Methodist Hospital over the next few months. And uh, we're going to be observing the, uh, you know, the performance through some success measures that we worked with the uh, ABB on and see like how this can be incorporated later on our operations on a wider scale, uh, including uh, the other uh, automation steps we discussed earlier. I'm gonna pass it on to Dr. Bakta to conclude the conversation here. Thank you so much. Um, and you know, this, this is just one step towards the future. Um, so working with ABB and uh, Chema's group um, here, um, you know, it's not only uh, creating efficiency, reducing kind of the manual work that goes into it, um, you'll see that we want to incorporate safety into the workflow as well. So that barcoding um, has to have a positive match to have that green light like you're seeing there. Um, it's also taking image capture and using some AI technology as well in the workflow. So we're kind of trying to innovate the way we we process um, and hopefully take it to um, the next level, which is going to be um, supporting kind of our, our picking um, methodology and delivery methodology over time. Um, and we'll see how that um, better supports safety and efficiency in our workplace. So um, we're excited to see this first step in the right direction. Okay, thank you for that. And again, I just want to emphasize, you know, this is a, a really good example of how external companies such as ABB Robotics, how they're working together in collaboration with, you know, they're here at Houston Methodist, right? And I remember how this project kind of kicked off, you know, we, um, I was, we were on site the day that uh, Chima and his team are over from ABB Robotics and they're kind of looking around. I remember distinctly being in the, the pharmacy room and there's a lot of stuff going on and there was one lady in particular who looked very kind of excited and she obviously worked there. She was very, she could see what was going on and I thought, you know what, I bet she knows a bunch of problems here. Um, so I went up to her and said, hey, you know, started telling us what, started saying what we're doing. I said, do you have any problems? And she said, yes. <laughs> And then within about 20, 30 seconds, she was leading me over to that area where they're sorting out all the pills. Um, so from that, you know, obviously you guys got really onto that and we're, we're digging in. And I love the fact how that this has become like becoming a solution now, right? How you're integrating ABB Robotics. Um, Dr. Lumsden, you got any comments? No, I, I mean, at the end of the day, co-localizing these technologies, we, it's very difficult when you have people who speak fundamentally different languages. And it's not real until you put them in the same room and you kind of see the operations and the, and the problem that you can identify these solutions. And, and that challenges are, and then the robot people who can say, hey, yeah, this, this is within my capability or not. And that's what we need to get back to. And I love to ask, you know, with your experience so far, what was the toughest part of the experience yet? Like, was it an admin side of things? Was it logistics? Where, where are the bottlenecks? Yeah, I think I think the uh, uh, for, from my end at least, what I would say is perhaps designing the entire process altogether because we really wanted to make sure that we are touching on the pain points uh, for the users. That probably has been the uh, the step that took the most most of our time. Uh, but otherwise, you know, once we define the uh, the issue and the and the pain point, it just becomes a matter of execution. How are you going to execute? How, what, what, you know, what's the timeline? You know, who is the vendor that you'd like to work with to make this happen? And the pharmacy world is so complex that you have like so many vendors out there and everyone like claims to deliver service for you. However, you know, here what we believe in is meaningful service and not necessarily the state of the art service. Um, if, if you can provide for me technology that is just new, uh, it may not serve my purpose um, as much as a technology that actually would serve the purpose for the pain point. And that's probably what took most of the time here, is just defining that problem um, and just trying to address it like, you know, from the source. And to your point also, Stuart, you know, when we talk to the end users, you know, that, that, that is probably the most important aspect of the project because you really want to hear from the first hand you know, grassroots of what is bothering them so you can like address their concerns in time. Plus what we're looking for here is also to deploy our pharmacy technicians to do more clinical work. That is the other piece that we're trying to address with this robot. I mean, some people may think that, you know, you introduce a robot, you're, you know, reducing like the workforce. 
As a matter of fact, we're actually redeploying our folks to do more clinical work that is actually just become an overload, uh, you know, on, on some of them. So it, it, it introduced some efficiencies that we'd like to see sooner or later. Yeah, and I totally, I totally agree. I think this project is an example of collaboration, and uh, and you were mentioning the the need and and the the background, the very different background and and uh, and, and specialist that we have in in every company. No, so we really need to to work together. So we have been working for around one year, reviewing the process, uh, defining very clearly the problem, and and testing different solutions and coming to the to the one that we will that we are going to to implement now. And in order to do that, we need to define a new process that needs to make sense for the people working in the pharmacy, of course. So uh, it's it's not working exactly as we were working before, but it needs to be an enhanced process that will have automation to support people. It should be like that. Super. Well, well thank you very much for those insightful comments. Um, we look forward to seeing the prototype, hopefully, next year's symposium. Um, okay, so on that note, we're going on to a, a more clinical perspective of robotics and, and, and education and training, etc. And I'm delighted to actually have in the studio uh, Dr. Stephanie Yee. Um, let me just get here. Okay, so Dr. Stephanie Yee, she is a pancreatic and kidney transplant surgeon and assistant professor of surgery here at Houston Methodist Hospital. Uh, she's heavily involved in the clinical robotic surgical procedures here. And today she's going to talk about a small approach to a big problem, adapting the robot for obesity and kidney transplantation. Dr. Yi. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for having me. Um, I look forward to talking with everyone uh, in a brief talk about our use of robotic transplant surgery here at Houston Methodist. Um, first, I would like to say I don't have any disclosures, um, although I do have some internal funding that has helped with some of the training aspect to this, uh, to this talk. So in the next 10 minutes or so, I'll discuss the surgical challenges in kidney transplant, uh, the ones that we face specifically related to obesity. I'll compare the robotic-assisted approaches with the open approach in kidney transplantation. And I'll discuss some of the surgical outcomes and the impact that I believe robotic transplantation will have uh, for our patients on dialysis. So the limitation of obesity from a surgical standpoint is really pretty profound uh, when we talk about kidney transplantation. Obesity has been shown to be a barrier uh, for patients with end-stage renal disease to have access to kidney transplant. This is mostly because of the poor outcomes that had traditionally been reported in obese patients who have undergone transplantation. And in a world where transplantation is based specifically on their outcomes, this has been very hard for transplant centers to accept larger patients um, on their candidate list. Um, as I mentioned, obese patients who undergo transplantation have worse outcomes, um, both in patient survival and graft survival. And so obesity has really been problematic um, in getting our patients to transplant. It's even a larger issue because approximately 40% of patients who have end-stage renal disease are also obese. And this may be a reflection of our larger patient population um, in that uh, obesity is just more prevalent. Um, the only problem, though, is kidney transplantation is not just a lifestyle modification, but it's a life-saving measure for patients on dialysis. And so the mortality of a patient who stays on dialysis is much higher than someone who gets to transplant. This is also reflected in this obesity paradox. So obesity itself confers a survival advantage in patients with end-stage renal disease. So our dialysis patients tend to be larger. Um, because they tend to just survive better than those that are malnourished or thinner. Um, but obesity is also a risk factor for kidney disease. So as our population gets larger, um, we'll see more patients on dialysis because of their risk factor for kidney disease. And what this graph shows is this paradox. Um, in the general population, as weight goes up, so does their mortality. Uh, but conversely, for dialysis patients, as their weight goes up, their mortality gets better. And so essentially, we're going to have more and more obese patients uh, needing uh, to be on dialysis and waiting, potentially waiting for transplant. This is what a lot of our patient population looks like now that are on dialysis. Unfortunately, they're obese. There's a lot of truncal obesity. And for anybody who's in the surgical field watching this, that is hugely problematic because this is where we're going to try to put a kidney transplant. 
from an open surgical challenge uh, or open surgical standpoint, the challenges in obese patients is that the surgeries um, in these patients are a lot more difficult. They take longer and they are subject to a higher rate of complications. So not just in kidney transplantation, but in general surgery or other surgical procedures. Specific to kidney transplant, these complications include almost a four time increase in surgical site infection, both deep or superficial. Um, you're battling with a lot more tissue and your incisions tend to have to be larger. There's also an over three times uh, increase in hernia rate, uh, which as you know, can cause uh, the need for just surgical procedures um, and the risks associated with that. There's increased risk of seromas um, or fluid accumulations around the graft, a wound dehiscence, that's when your wound opens, and longer hospital length of stay, increase in resources um, for medical care, and just overall, um, just worse compared to the non-obese population. There's also an increased risk for delayed graft function. Uh, that's the requirement for dialysis within the first week post-transplant. The problem with delayed graft function is that it actually is a risk factor for rejection, allograft rejection within the first six months. And for those of you who are familiar with transplantation, um, having rejection early after transplant actually is, confers a really poor prognosis for graft survival in general. So overall, it's very challenging to want to operate on these patients. So I'm a general surgeon by training, um, and we often learned the minimally invasive approach can save a lot of these obese patients from some of these bad complications that I just described. So this is me in the operating room one day. Um, I was doing open procedure and there was a robot hanging out in the room. And I wanted to know how we can adopt this for Methodists as we watch our patient population get bigger and bigger. So the utilization of the robot for um, kidney transplantation is like an opportunity to perform this procedure in a minimally invasive approach and potentially decrease those risks that I just described. We're not the first group to do this here, but it has certainly been starting to be more prevalent and adopted at other transplant centers as our population gets larger. Some of the benefits um, is the better visualization of the surgical field. And let me give you an example of what I mean. So this is an obese abdomen. This is not of our patient. I actually took this from a paper. Um, but this is a mildly obese abdomen. And in an open kidney transplant, you usually make a very large incision. Um, in this case, this was played on the left lower quadrant. You can see a, another incision here. A patient probably had a kidney transplant before. But we're looking at about a 15, 20 centimeter incision at least. And then a lot of tissue to have to go down in. And once you actually get to the iliac vessels, which is where we normally transplant our kidneys, you're going to be looking in this deep hole. Um, it's difficult for the surgeons at the bedside to see. It's impossible for the medical students to see. And I couldn't even get a video of this because you just can't even see anything. Um, there, it requires a lot of manual dexterity and kind of pushing the graft around to try to get the surgeon to just even see where they're sewing. Um, and as I mentioned, you know, it could be very challenging no matter how well you try to plan for this and the type of equipment you bring in. It could be very challenging uh, to sew this kidney in um, and do it safely. If we look at a minimally invasive approach, this is the abdomen of a patient who underwent uh, a robotic assisted kidney transplant. You can see now there's only about three or four port sites. They're about um, eight millimeters each. And there's a, in this case, they did an epigastric incision. You can actually lower it and put it around the umbilicus or make a fan and steel lower down. Um, and this incision is only about six to seven centimeters. It has to be big enough just to um, put the kidney in and then sew it up. And so you can see just based on the size of the um, incisions that that probably decreases those uh, surgical risks that I had described. And then in terms of the visualization, you're just able to get right into the abdomen, right into where you need to see. It doesn't matter how deep this patient is. This is an example of the venous anastomosis on the kidney transplant. So the blue, whoops, the, well, the blue uh, vessel that you saw is actually the renal vein and that was the il external iliac vein. This is a picture of the, um, the renal artery being anastomosed now onto the external iliac artery. Um, of the recipient, and I just fast forwarded it for uh, the purposes of time for this talk. But as you can see, the surgeon is able to move the camera according to the way that they want it um, visualized. You're not relying on someone else to move around in a small hole. 
and you can really just get great exposure uh, for what otherwise would be impossible to see. So as I mentioned, you get better visualization in the surgical field, you get improved dexterity in that deep space based on the articulation of the robotic instruments. And then the benefits, reduced uh, recovery period, decrease in those surgical site infections, decrease hernia risk because the incision is smaller. And I cited a paper from the group from the University of Illinois, Chicago. Um, who also at 10 years noted um, pretty comparable graft and patient survival, and this is comparable to non-obese patients that they took from the UNOS database. I have to also say we were able to adopt some of this onto our living donors who want to donate a kidney. Uh, certainly within reason, we don't take all obesity for the living donors, but for those that we have traditionally uh, taken off our consideration list, we've been able to take some of our um, mildly obese patients for donation by using the robot. I have to admit there are challenges in adopting such um, kind of a new technology whenever it comes for a surgical procedure. This is not a standardized procedure and a lot of the surgeons that are adopting this weren't trained to do robotic kidney transplants. I certainly didn't have that in my training and I had to go out and seek additional training. Um, but I am happy, so this is a picture of our surgery cart for robotics, I'm very excited about that. There is the training cost, the equipment cost, and the administration buy-in, but once you get that, I think it's going to make a great difference um, for our patient population. So the benefits are now we're looking at higher BMI patients to do transplant instead of telling people, no, we can't help you. Um, we've been able to develop a robotic transplant program and bring in additional staff to help grow it. And the one part I wish I had more time to talk about is we're now working with engineers in a collaboration to help study surgical setup, maybe even consider the use of artificial intelligence um, in assisting for this procedure, and just some new exciting ways to better improve the use of the robot for our patient population. So in summary, uh, robotic surgery can improve access to kidney transplant for these obese, obese patients. The surgical uh, exposure is much improved in this patient population. It has been shown to reduce post-operative wound complications and other post-op complications. Um, and then it can also help reduce the mortality that end-stage renal disease confers upon our obese patients. And I hope I have time for questions. I do want to give a great thank you for the people um, that I've listed here. Um, thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Um, I think that's a, doc, well, actually, Dr. Lumsden, you've got a couple of comments. Yeah, that was great. When we talk to Intuitive, I'm a vascular surgeon, they say, we don't support vascular surgery. <laughs> Looked like a vascular operation to me that you were doing. And so I'm kind of amazed that Intuitive have actually taken that approach, although they've been very helpful, as you know, we're starting to build this. Mm -hmm. But they're doing va a lot of people doing vascular operations using the robot at the mm -hmm. moment. And, you know, I presume you went up to Chicago, and that's mm -hmm. where kind of you learn. I mean, it's the only place in the United States that I'm aware yeah. of that you can actually go and do that, mm -hmm. that at the moment. And so how often do you think you're going to be doing a robotic kidney transplant? And why does it make a big difference if you move the incision from the right lower quad? Because you're still going to make an incision to get the kidney in and out of mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. so f as kind of as I'm... So for your first question, we hope to do this pretty often. I mean, mm -hmm. we have so many obese patients. I'm talking about obese with a BMI greater than 35, a lot of truncal obesity. I think we have a lot of those patients that we're currently putting on hold waiting for weight loss. They can't lose their weight and you know their mortality goes up as they wait. So I'm hoping that this will be a common part of our practice as we get patients coming in. Um, and in terms of uh, how often do we uh, adopt this mm -hmm. for our patients? <clears throat> well, so that I guess that's the answer. Yeah, we just hope to so incorporate that as part of our normal practice. So let me ask you a question. You, the problem with blood operating blood vessels is they bleed. Yeah. <laughs> and so how do you control, so is there a need for the people who are watching this, what tools would you, do you wish you had that you don't have at the moment? I mean, it's a lot of practice, okay. I have to say, for start number one. Um, the, the biggest tools are just being able to have the comfort of mm -hmm. using the robot as if you were doing it open. 
I mean, I think that would be the biggest tools. We, we have need. adjusted the correct the clamps and yeah. stuff that we use. We've right. adjusted so it's specific to the robot and specific to the field that we're working so in. So do you have good vascular clamps? We do. So we Can you suck out a lot of blood if all of a sudden the clamp comes off and the LA echo is pouring true. blood out of there? Yeah, and the, and you have to have mm -hmm. a good um, plan B, which is to not be afraid to open if you're in that position. All right, very interesting. Thank you for uh, Dr. Yi. Um, we have our next guest in the studio. Um, delighted to have Dr. Edward Chan here. Uh, so Dr. Chan is a lung and thoracic transplant surgeon and assistant professor of surgery here at Houston Methodist. He's also heavily involved in the clinical robotic surgical procedures, including education and training development. And today he'll be talking to us about robotic surgical training and graduate medical education, pearls and pitfalls. Hi, thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Uh, it's great to be here for the symposium. Um, I really appreciate the opportunity to discuss robotic surgical training in, uh, as it relates to our fellows and residents. So uh, as you mentioned, I am a thoracic surgeon here at Houston Methodist with uh, a specific interest in robotic surgery. I'm also an associate program director for the general surgery residency program, as well as uh, the program director for the American College of Surgeons uh, accredited Education Institute's Education Fellowship. Um, I do teach courses for Olympus and Intuitive uh, as a disclosure. And I wanted to talk about uh, a couple of different things, sort of how surgeons learn uh, and then how different pathways have been laid out for our learners, whether they're residents or fellows. Uh, give a couple examples from our own experience uh, on the thoracic surgery service and then discuss some lessons that we've learned. Um, so just to start, you know, as a bit of background, uh, this is a painting called The Gross Clinic by Thomas Aikens. Uh, and this is sort of how surgery was taught and how it was learned uh, way back, uh, originally before the whole current education system was set up. So this is back from 1875, a depiction of Dr. Samuel Gross, uh, who was a professor of surgery at uh, Jefferson Medical College in Philadelphia. And you can see that he was operating in front of a theater full of people who are observing the, the surgery and watching that way, and that's how they learned in medical school and in, uh, you know, in, in training. And it's hard to talk about surgical training without talking about Dr. Halstead, who is the first surgeon in chief and uh, professor of surgery at Johns Hopkins uh, back in the 1890s. Uh, he created the first formal surgical residency programs. Uh, and so he really borrowed from a, a German model of training by creating a formal tiered system with graduate responsibility given to residents at uh, various levels that progressed from junior to senior uh, levels of training. So when we talk about <coughs> setting guidelines for training surgical residents, uh, we have to set the bar very high because especially for surgical specialties, you know, competency is so important and so critical to um, their, their performance. Uh, but in addition to just technical skills, you know, even more important is teaching surgical judgment. Um, the ACGME has laid out various core competencies uh, that are guidelines for what uh, needs to be taught or what needs to be attained before graduation. Um, but also they have you know, various work hour restrictions that have limited the amount of time that uh, residents will spend in the hospital as well as uh, in the operating room. And so, you know, especially as, uh, as the number of hours uh, decreased and especially with COVID, the number of cases decreased as well, there were limited opportunities uh, or decreasing opportunities for residents to be in the operating room and also to learn new technologies. And so as, uh, as it relates to robotics, you know, anytime a new technology is in place, it makes it more uh, critical for uh, learners to be able to have as much exposure as possible as well as uh, get hands-on uh, experience. So it forced not only the learners to adapt, but also the faculty to adjust to their teaching styles uh, to adopt these new technologies. So as we go over the idea of, of uh, how we teach robotics or teach surgery, you know, there's sort of a, a framework of, of adult learning that we talk about in terms of how the process by which students gain these skills uh, is in and of itself not the, the end product, but the, the process is, is so critical. And it's something that students really have to engage in um, and find value in for themselves to, to buy into this kind of training. And so we talk about sort of a, a model of skills acquisition uh, and we, as we take these learners from novice to expert level, we want to ensure that we attain competency 
and the safety uh, first and foremost. So talking about different um, modalities to, to teach residents, obviously the most important time for them is spent in the operating room where they're being supervised by faculty and as teachers. And given that that's such a limited resource, we have to aim to supplement it with other uh, modalities. So whether it's formal didactic courses, hands-on courses, skills labs with model trainers, inanimate tissue models, or even live animal models, these are all critical uh, resources for us to teach new technologies like robotics to our learners. Uh, also, educational resources we have online and different credentialing processes uh, are important for helping to uh, assess uh, the attainment of those skills. Um, simulation obviously is critical because we have to, uh, because the time in the operating room is such a limited resource. So developing tools for simulation as well as for assessing learners uh, is uh, really essential for this process. To talk a little bit about our own experience on the thoracic surgery service, we started by conducting a needs assessment for where the, the greatest opportunities were for learners, especially as they learned robotics. We found that a video-based curriculum was uh, a high priority, as well as uh, maximizing the number of opportunities for hands-on learning. So as part of the needs assessment, we um, did a survey for our residents and found that overall uh, they wanted more time um, controlling the robot, as well as uh, developing the, uh, an ability to, to observe cases and sort of have a video-based education system uh, to help guide their, their uh, surgical training. So one of the uh, areas in, that we addressed was with a video-based curriculum. Um, we found the need for uh, both narrated and annotated videos, uh, and that was identified by the residents as one of the, the key components to their uh, learning. And also uh, deciding whether or not to include the complete operative video versus just highlights you know, that varied a little bit by the, the um, seniority or the PGY level of, uh, of the resident. So one project that we worked on was to create a task deconstruction of an index operation, like a hiatal hernia repair. We did that through a Delphi process and you know, got various subject matter experts to come to a consensus on what the critical steps of the operation were. And by doing so, we were able to um, break down the operation into steps so that both learners as well as the faculty could uh, compartmentalize the operation as much as possible. This is a brief clip as an example of one of the videos that we made where it's annotated and it's narrated as well so it helps to identify for learners uh, the anatomy, the steps of the operation, uh, and this one in particular is uh, edited down to about four minutes, so it's very uh, digestible for learners to um, to review prior to go to the uh, the operating room. This is something that our fellow uh, Haiti Del Calvo uh, did as part of her fellowship last year. One of the uh, metrics we used to assess the effectiveness of this curriculum was to see how much time the residents spent on the console before and after we implemented the video-based curriculum. So we saw a significant increase in the amount of time that they were actually operating on the console based on their, um, based on their uh, use of the uh, video-based curriculum. Another example of uh, our hands-on learning that was uh, found to be very valuable was having uh, the implementation of a monthly wet lab that we've created at MITEI. So uh, once a month prior to starting the thoracic surgery rotation, we have a wet lab with uh, several uh, uh, pigs as well as uh, inanimate models for the residents who are coming onto the service to have an opportunity to practice doing the steps of a high hernia operation, as well as familiarize themselves with the docking and undocking procedure, as well as um, practicing going through the steps of an emergency undocking procedure. And that's done in an interprofessional manner with uh, staff from the operating room as well to try to maximize the safety and efficacy of the training. So, you know, the, uh, as I wrap up here, um, one of the needs that we found was that many curricula exist in terms of uh, teaching robotics for general surgery uh, residents, but very few standards uh, are 
universally agreed upon. And many of the common components that come into these um, curricula include online modules, simulators, and use numbers of cases as a bedside assistant or as a, number, as a console surgeon as a metric for how, um, how trained or qualified the, the resident is. And obviously, you know, the pure number of cases is not always uh, an accurate reflection of how competent a learner is. And so as we move away from just pure numbers of cases, we're trying to develop more of uh, more robust assessment tools that are better able to assess competency rather than just pure numbers of, uh, of operations performed. So in conclusion, um, you know, the critical parts are to establish standards of competency that are accurate measures of uh, true surgical ability, uh, developing innovative methods of teaching that can optimize learning for learners of all levels, and also uh, committing to lifelong learning and improvement for both uh, learners in their graduate medical education as well as practicing surgeons. Thank you very much, and I'd be happy to take any questions. Okay, thank you, Dr. John. Hey, Dr. Lumsden, can you comment? Yeah, so let me press you a little further on a video-based curriculum. That can cover a multitude of sins. What does, that, what does that mean? I mean, you showed us a video with labels on it. Um, you're going to hear from fundamental surgery shortly, which it takes a whole, and, you know, video-based curriculum to a whole different level, potentially. So what exactly have you done, and what do you think could, could augment what you're already doing? I think that, you know, uh, based on our, our you know, t discussing with our residents, doing a needs assessment, it seems that residents largely are using video-based platforms now already to, to learn about their, um, the cases before they go and to prepare uh, to learn uh, the anatomy. Um, and obviously the, the, you know, the Heart and Vascular Center has a very robust library which is very well uh, utilized. I think that one of the important things that we found is that um, because of the variety of resources available online, there's very little quality control. Mm -hmm. And so I think something that, that we've strived for is to try to get um, videos of our surgeries that are done by our surgeons and use that as a, as a metric for you know, what is um, expected of our residents because they're going to be operating with us and so they know what to expect coming into the operating room, as opposed to sort of just searching YouTube and, and finding you know, uh, 50 videos of which you have no idea what the quality is. So I think that, you know, that the quality control is probably the most important thing. Um, but also, I think that uh, for, for example, for junior residents, it was more important for them to see annotation of what the anatomy was so they could understand sort of the basic structure of the operation. Or um, they might want a more abridged video so that it could be faster as opposed to a more senior resident would want to see a more, like a sped up version of the full operation so they could capture some of the nuances of, of, the, of the surgery. Do you capture complications? That's a good point. We, d we, don't, uh, <laughs> we don't have that, but I think that obviously is a very useful teaching tool. That's part of what we do for the lab is we, we practice going through emergency undocking. Um, in the case of a, of a bleeding emergency, how do you safely convert to open? And obviously it's something that, that happens rarely, but it's something that you want to have practice doing so that it doesn't happen for the first time when you're in a real life situation. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you very much thank for, you. for coming to the studio, Dr. Chan. Uh, and we are now going on to the, the final session um, of this symposium. We've entitled it Welcome to the Mightyverse. Uh, this is something extra special we've been working on the last kind of year and a half. Uh, I'm delighted to have in the studio with us uh, Chris Scattergood. He's founder of Fundamental Surgery. Um, he will be giving a little bit of an intro later. And we also have patching in via Zoom. We have Henry Hinchbeck. Sorry, Henry Pinchbeck, he's CEO and uh, founder of CD Li uh, 3D Life Print, sorry. And we also have Paul Fotheringham, who is Chief Operations Officer of 3D Life Prints. Now, all this collaboration, all these people will make sense in one minute, but I'm going to um, start with my slides, if I could just plug this in, just to give a little bit of background of how, how we actually got here in the first place. So, Donaldson, you want to give a background on 2020 pandemic zoom going into VR yeah so I mean we're, we have tremendous resources here at um, Houston Mathis and one of them is what's referred to as mighty which is a hands-on training center um, which we think is one of the best in the world 
then all of a sudden the pandemic hits and having a hands-on training centre doesn't really help you uh, when we've essentially two years in which we can't bring a single person into it. And so, you know, it made us sit and contemplate how could we deliver training virtually. We were already doing things like this out of the studio, but you've heard a lot about haptic feedback, how do you make these videos interactive, and that's really what led us, hopefully we don't have another pandemic, but that's really what led us to start exploring different vehicles by which we could deliver educational content. Yeah, and as you can see from the slide here, I've just kind of highlighted two of the main kind of hardware platforms I looked at. One is Oculus Quest 2 system from Meta. The second is Microsoft HoloLens. Now, now please keep in mind, in, I think it was October 2020, um, you know, Facebook or, or Meta, as they're now called, released the Oculus 2 Quest system. First time ever for $300 you could buy an independent wireless system. Um, and be in fully immersive VR. You know, before that, you would have a tether system, you need a PC, a big expensive GPU. So we really wanted to test out the Oculus Quest system. And um, you, got, you can see kind of a rough kind of plain board here of some of the companies we, we looked at and some of the, the software, etc. cetera. Um, but before we get into it, let me just play a little promo video of the Mightyverse. It's, I think video is always are good at encapsulating the idea. At Houston Methodist, we are creating new realities for our patients, staff, and the global health community. Viewing the whole patient at a time. Exploring the heart from the inside out. Hands-on practice when you need it the most. Remote assistance for times of urgency. And if we are limited by our reality, we create a new one. Welcome to the Mightyverse. So there's just a little sneak peek there. And again, you know, we were limited by our reality back in 2020. So we did go out and build a new one. Um, and so what is the Mightyverse? Well, it's, as we mentioned before, it's an extension of the Houston Methodist Institute for Technology, Innovation and Education, but an extended reality. And it really consists of two major things. One is virtual reality and augmented reality applications. Um, our flagship product is the Mightyverse VR app, and that's available for use in Oculus Quest headsets. If you want more information, please go to mightyverse.app. Um, this is an invite only at the moment. It's not publicly available, but if you're interested, go there, type in your email address, we can get in touch. And we formed a, de a development partnership with Fundamental VR, and we also formed a collaborative partnership with 3D Life Prints. The central question to all this is how do we offer Mighty services using a leading medicine approach? And that's very, very um, important to us. You know. Obviously, Meta is out there building what they're calling the Metaverse, right? So we, we see Mightyverse as a first step towards a medical Metaverse. And, you know, I think it would make more sense to have experienced surgeons and healthcare practitioners building out that medical Metaverse rather than leaving it all to Meta. So I'm going to, uh, I'd, my pleasure to introduce again Chris Scattergood. He's going to talk about Fundamental VR, his company, and how they integrated to help us build it. Chris. Great, thank you very much. <coughs> Excuse me, thank you very much, Stuart, appreciate that, and thank you very much for having us here today. It's real great to uh, be here. Uh, I'm gonna start off just by giving you a couple of slides that talk about our company so you can see what our background is. I'm Chris Scattergood, I'm one of the co-founders of Fundamental VR. Um, Fundamental VR, um, we've been working in the VR space, and in particular on uh, medical and surgical education for about seven years now, and we've got the brand Fundamental Surgery, and, and it's uh, those solutions that we're bringing to this. So our company and mission, so as I mentioned, the, the customers that we work with are really med device, uh, robotic assisted surgical devices, uh, pharma and HCPs. We've been doing this for seven years, as I mentioned. We're a SaaS business, and there's now 115 of us. We're based out of the UK and out of uh, the US, and most of our work is actually for US customers. We're backed by a number of different uh, venture capitalists, and also, as you can see, uh, including Mayo Clinic and Santa Clinic of Germany. For us, 
what this technology does is it gives us the ability to accelerate human capability with precise simulation. And we do that in a number of different areas and for a number of different clients. So here's a quick example of some of the people that we're working with now, we've created simulation with to really help use this technology to accelerate the education um, from robotics to pharma, etc. Uh, of all of those uh, clients that we have up there, we're really excited about this partnership we have with Houston Methodist and what that means uh, for everybody. Uh, we'll talk about that in a moment. I just wanted to give you some uh, very quick examples of the sort of solutions we're doing. So as you can see, there's a little thumbnail running of some of the work we've done in robotic surgery. Uh, so in robotic surgery, we're able to do a number of things using VR, whether that is to help educate a surgeon and get uh, great surgical practice, or whether it's to help the surgical team to set up and use the robot effectively. Of course, the challenge in uh, uh, robotics with surgery is making sure that one, it's adopted, and secondly, it's utilized, and it's utilized effectively. And um, we're able to create different solutions for those different uh, needs. We're also working in the interventional space and cardiology space. And I think um, the technology as it's evolving and it's moving so fast, really gives people a, a clear advantage in accelerating the adoption of their products. We're one of the companies that specialise in haptic VR. Um, we're able to do that as well as the standalone VR that Stuart talked about. And what we see there is the ability to really reach um, maximum volumes of people and allow people to collaborate in real time across multiple geographies. And you talked about some of the headsets that are available on the market. For us, it's really important that we're device agnostic because you don't want to get tied into a platform and find you're stuck with it in two years time when that platform may have changed or not changed as you might want it to have done. So being hardware agnostic is really important. And it's that collaboration that comes from that that is so important, as well as the ability to be accredited or validated. And in all of our education and uh, in the stuff we're working on with Stuart and the guys, it's really important for us to allow people to learn, allow them to practice and allow them to test as well. Uh, and a good example of that is the work that we've done with CMR, where a trainee um, can put a headset on, they don't need to travel to go and um, visit a centre and visit a robot. They can do this from the comfort of their own home. So whereas they would practice on the real robot, as you can see, we mimic that exactly. And you can do that as learning, you can do it as practice, and you can do it as test. And it's that kind of objective assessment that we think is the way forward. And that's from me. Okay. Thank you, Chris. Um, right, so we're going to show a couple of clips from the Mindiverse. Uh, this was taken literally about a week ago, so her off the press. Uh, if you'd just like to see my slides there, guys. Okay, so this is what the user would see when they enter the Mindiverse. This is the auditorium, or should I say, sorry, it's the lobby. So you can see here in the background, Waller Tower. Again, this was as if the user is actually placed here in the heart of the Texas Medical Center. Now, we're going to go into one of the rooms. The first one is the, the auditorium, or should I say it's the John F. Bookout VR rendering of the auditorium. So, the presenter is there on the, on the stage, as he's at the podium. And what you're seeing there are six people in the audience. Now, we've actually embedded uh, certain like, user effects and emojis, you know, just to really enhance that interaction. Like, we really do feel that interaction in this space is critical. You've got to get feedback. You've got, it has to be as realistic as if you're actually there in person with these people. Um, so you just saw like a kind of behind the scenes shot there. Oh, here we go. So this is what it looks like if you're actually in the audience. So you can see there, you can pull up your menus, you can add all your different user effects, you know, to express how you're feeling. But also, you know, you can actually talk to the people. Now we took the audio out uh, at this point just because of the direction and um, the, the production stuff. but. You're in there talking to people from different countries. I think we had one person in there from the UK, there was someone there from the Netherlands, and there was zero latency. So that was a big, important, critical factor for us. We did not want audio, we didn't want, like, sorry, um, long latencies and delays uh, when we're interacting with each other. And you can see here, we have this little bit of a confetti drop. This is really just more for, uh, if you want to, like, publish something or say something really, really big. Again, it's we're gradually bringing a little bit of gamification into this as well. You know, VR shouldn't be about just recreating the physical world. It has to enhance what's out there. Like, the only limit in this is really your imagination. 
Um, we're going to take you into another room. So this is our DeBakey Heart and Vascular Center room. So this has all of our content. So here we've actually got four videos that each come up with the model. So you hear, you see one of Dr. Lumsden's um, uh, procedures in the OR. Then you have an anatomical kind of phantom that shows up. And then you're seeing in the background there an actual 3D rendered object of that patient's heart, which is anatomically correct to size. Um, we have six users who are coming in. They're all gathering around. They're kind of seeing the, the video, they're seeing the heart, they're talking to each other. And we're going back to the list here. So we actually want to pick up the 3D model. So they go back and we're choosing a 3D model to pick up. Now what you're seeing here are the users are able to pick up that model and to pass it around. So you see someone has it there and they're about to bring it over to the person's point of view. You get a nice close up of that heart. Now again, we're going to hear from 3D Life Prints, but these models were segmented, rendered and fully texturized and optimized by 3D Life Prints. Because, you know, we, and again, we want these things to scale. We want them to be as realistic as possible. You can see there, Dr. Picture Dr. DeBakey in the background, again, stand in front of Walter Tower and the Houston Methodist system. So I mentioned there, you know, optimizing these models in the space. And I'm going to cut now to, to 3D life prints because, you know, they don't know that this modern work here. Uh, again, we have Henry Hinch, uh, sorry, Henry Pinchbeck and Paul Thop Fothrenham. Henry, can you hear us? Yeah, hi there, Stuart. How are you doing? Good, thanks. Thanks for coming on the show. We'd love to hear a little bit more about 3D life prints and how you integrated with us on this project. Sure, yeah, no problem at all. Um, very uh, pleased to be here, and that looks so impressive. Actually, it's moved on so far since I saw it last. You guys are moving at, pay at pace. So congratulations on that, and thanks for the invite. So what I propose to do is um, uh, give you a quick chat about 3D Live Prints, won't take too long, a bit of background to the company, that kind of thing, and then hopefully we can get on and talk some more about those models that we created for you guys. And, um, and really delve into kind of the benefits uh, of a company like ours, how it can integrate with companies like yours. So let me share my screen for a sec. Oh, here we go, that's great, even better. Can you go, um, uh, that, that's fine, start there. So um, as you see, what I've written here is, um, we're a provider of personalized surgery. And, and, and Stuart, this is something I'm, you know, I'd quite like to come back to actually, because uh, personalized surgery for us is like an umbrella term that we use for the whole marketplace here, which involves what we do, which is kind of uh, digital surgery, uh, 3D printed models, and 3D printed implants, cutting guides, but also the VR stuff, the robotic stuff. I think there's a bit, we're missing something here about having a, a general term for this. Anyway, we can probably talk about that afterwards. But our version of personalized surgery, what we do, not just with Houston Methodist in the UK, is that um, we digitize the surgical process. The first step is digitization, segmentation of data, digitize the surgical process. And then um, we, what we do afterwards is we then, actually, I'm going to share my screen because you're clicking on a bit there. Okay. There we go. Uh, once we've digitized the surgical process, uh, we then create um, uh, models or um, devices which are personal to the patient. And we showed some examples there where you were, uh, were showing the, um, uh, the models in the, in the Mightyverse. And as a background to the company, we have, um, what we do is we deploy our personnel in the UK so far, we'll get onto the US next, uh, at the point of care into host hospitals. And so that means that our engineers, our tech is, uh, is provided at the point of care to interact directly with the surgeons. That gives us a distinct advantage. And the surgeons a distinct advantage in actually managing to create these uh, devices accurately. Um, we're, we're not a new company. We've supplied thousands of patient specific devices over the past few years. And we take our certifications and our quality controls extremely seriously. You'll see here that we are ISO certified um, 13485, which is for the design and manufacture of patient specific uh, uh, devices. Uh, we also uh, MDR compliant for the EU after the UK left, where you have your own opinions on how that's fallen out. Um, but the most important thing that's happened this week, I'm really pleased to say, is we are FDA cleared. We received our first FDA clearance this week massive step forward in the US for 3D life prints. I'm ever so pleased to be able to. You're the first people I've told about this. The press release hasn't even been drafted yet. So 50A clearance was achieved this week. Um, and just following on from that, you can see that as we um, 
uh, as well as being cleared by the FDA, we're now opening our first facility. And it's just uh, across the corridor in the Texas Medical Center where you guys are now. Um, uh, and that will be our base for Texas. That will be our base uh, for, the, for, for the rollout for our business model across the US. And we really look forward to working with both you guys and the other local hospitals as well. But obviously you've got a special place in our hearts. Okay, moving on to from who we are to what we do. Um, here we go, quick look. Um, I've covered some of this already. So we have a dual type of business model where either we're working at the point of care, such as we will do with uh, Houston Methodist, where we'll supply our engineer and our tech at the point of care, or sometimes we can't be in every hospital in the world. We do engage with surgeons as well remotely. So they'll get on our platform, engage with us through the platform. We'll do the digital surgery for them and we'll create the, the devices for them and send them to them. And um, so that takes us on to kind of the things that we can do. As I talked about, we have the segmentation is the underlying technology to all of this, uh, all of this work. Once we've segmented out the models, then we can perform the virtual surgery. And once we've done that, those two stages, we then get into making stuff, or albeit digitally or, um, or physically, anatomical models, surgical cutting guides, custom implants, which are like the end product, the top product in our market. And we also make surgical simulation solutions as well, where they're not going to be clinical. We're just talking about something in the education space, the R&D space, the learning space. Um, we are truly multidisciplinary. Um, most importantly for this call, obviously we do lots of work in cardiothoracic, complex cardiothoracic, but also um, pediatric, a big area of ours, oncology, because so many oncology cases are so unique. They work really well with patient-specific simulated, uh, simulated models. So that's a little background to the company. As I said, I've got lots of things I could add about, um, about personalized surgery more generally, but I'll pass back to you, uh, Stuart, to, um, uh, to pick up from there if you don't mind. And relocating to Houston, uh, sorry, yeah, relocating to, to Houston, you know. Um, so I'm, I'm just going to show a little clip from the 3D Life Prince room. I'm going to have Dr. Lumsden kind of comment in the background here. Yeah, so what's fascinating to me about what you're doing is we've been very interested in using segmentation of CT scans. We believe the CT scan is the patient's universe. Everything related to that patient is in that CT scan. How you optimize that CT scan before the procedure fundamentally drives the efficacy of what you're doing. And so, you know, that we're really focused on how those CT scans are acquired. And then it, you can segment out what we are particularly interested in. And so being able to texturize this or handle these things, I, I'm not a big believer in the 3D hands-on model. I think there are certain situations where that's going to be very valuable, but increasingly I think this is all going to be done in a VR or a, or a digital environment. So I'm really delighted to see you know, how much progress that you've basically had in, in, in pushing that. And so I'm, I'm an imager. I'm a vascular surgeon who believes it's the first, second, third rules are imaging, imaging, imaging. Your company doesn't exist without CT scans being available to drive the creation they see of these models. And so I think that's an area where increasing collaboration you know, is a huge opportunity. And also creating animations off of these uh, very accurate 3D models. We, we have one example, we did that with uh, Bruce Blousen uh, on, on a case. And so what I think we deliver is that we film every case that we've done. If you're going to build an animation, you actually need to know what the process of the operation is and using the preoperative CT scan. So it's this wealth of information that can be pulled in to kind of create not just anatomically correct models, but surgically correct animations and models. Thank you, Dr. Lums. And, and, you know, just while we're playing the background, I'm just going to pull it into the fundamental VR room as well there. I, again, uh, the, we are still exploring the Mightyverse. We're looking at use cases, like what works for us, what doesn't. And we really f figure that the ability to have collaborators and even industrial um, you know, med device companies have real estate and space in the Mightyverse is, is very important. Because you're, you're going to be able to 24-7, it's like a 24-7 conference, right? You can go into these people's rooms and explore the innovation, technology, and education. You can meet with these people as well. It, it really does break down physical barriers um, and especially if you look at for example in our study room you know this is everyone in here and we're just like you know we're kind of looking at a video there but you can pull in presentations you can start drafting things on whiteboards but then imagine you're developing a medical device right you know you've got a bunch of CAD 
figures. Okay, those are 3D objects which you can pull into the Miniverse and start exploring, and start innovating. Um, I think we've got one last, um, yeah, there's one last clip from the Mightyverse, and this is actually our, our Matterport scans. So, if you actually want to go to a facility and see it, I guess, as close to physical as possible, you can do it with Matterport scans. So, this is the Centre for Innovation uh, Tech Hub, and this takes you out in the Mightyverse into that other adjacent VR world. And here you are, now you're at the Tech Hub, the Houston Methodist. Kind of walking around. And again, you know, the Tech Hub is here on site, who's the Methodist. It's, uh, a, it's one of our to go areas, pretty much the to go area for digital health here, uh, as well as other things at Houston Methodist. And you can see here that they're going into one of the, the, the mock uh, patient rooms. So, again, this is just another example of the, the functionality that we're building in to the Mightyverse. Um, before I go on, I'm going to go back to the, the 3D life prints and, and just take a little. A segment or a little input from Paul. Um, oh, hang on, where we go here? So, Paul, maybe you can talk to us just about what actually needs to be done in order to get these models and optimize them, etc., and, and where you feel three life prints plays in the VR space. Sure. Hi, everyone. So, my name is Paul Fotheringham. I'm actually the Chief Technology Officer um, for Three Life Prints. And uh, it's been wonderful working with Stuart and the team around the creation of these models and pulling them into the, the mighty verse. So, really, as Dr. Lumsden mentioned, there's a number of ways we can pull it in from CT, from PET scans, from MRI scans. Uh, and we use a variety of software um, to extrapolate the regions of interest. Uh, and then Autodesk or CAD type software then to, to bring that into a 3D model. Um, part of the problem has been traditionally with VR, we've been doing VR now for about 10 years starting in Liverpool, is around uh, the size of the models, number of triangles, number of polygons. And so it's been challenging for us certainly to be able to work with, as Stuart mentioned, the latency in the platform. I think when we first used Lou Stuart, uh, some of the models just fell over immediately because they were just too large. But Stuart's uh, sort of built this platform with fundamental VR. It's allowed us to put in some extremely complex models. So, so this, you know, we hope this gives the, the audience and the viewers like a kind of glimpse into the, the area that we're exploring here. Um, and the thing that always gets me is whenever I get a new build from Fundamental VR, straight away I'm in there. You know, I can't wait for the, for the next build. But it sounds a bit silly, but sometimes it actually does feel like you're exploring a new world. And in a sense, you kind of are. Like you're in something that you've just developed in the metaphysical kind of metaverse, and then you're in there. You're, you're seeing what works. You're seeing what doesn't work. You're like, well, hey, no one's been here before. And then there was a funny thing where, um, where I was actually in there with Homer Kitana the other day, and we're going through the functionality. And out of nowhere, someone just popped in, and it was one of the developers. <laughs> we were like, hello. So we ended up just having this random serendipitous chat. But again, it was like, it just emphasized the whole point that you can network in here, you can meet people. Um, so, like I said, if you want to go to miniverse.app, and if you're interested in this, please put your email in there and we'll get back to you. It's not for public download yet. Um, and we have talked about the VR aspect of Miniverse, but there's an augmented reality aspect as well. I'm going to give you a little tour here that uh, Homer Kitana took. Can you see this? Okay. through that perspective. I'm recording in 4K and walking you through Mighty with different content and digital assets. I see we're going to start here with a video from Dr. Alan Lumsden. Hello, my name is uh, Dr. Alan Lumsden. I'm the medical director here at Mighty. Mighty stands for the Methodist Institute for Technology, Innovation and Education. I fundamentally believe this is the best training environment in the world. Over 65,000 people have come through uh, this space to learn new procedures and new skills uh, from numerous countries from around the world. And we've had over 400 different clients who have been served by this institution. Thank you for your interest and welcome to MITE. Thank you, Dr. Lumsden. Now we're going to be walking through a component of MITE where I've laid out different digital assets uh, in an augmented and mixed media space. So the first thing we're going to be looking at is a closing wedge osteotomy technology created by 3D Life Prints. They create these cutting guides and here it's for femoral deformity. So as you can see, here's an image of where you would find the femoral deformity in the patient. Here's an image of the guide over uh, the femoral bone itself to show you where you're going to be making your cut. 
and of course more imaging and of course we have a video here that's going to play and explain the technology we mirror the opposite femur this gives us a template to work to and allows us to create a symmetric correction for the patient we then align the mirrored left femur to the affected right femur here we begin to see the extent of the deformity and the direction the femur needs to move for a successful correction a wedge is then created that allows for the correction in all three planes and at the same time correcting for the leg length discrepancy. Here we see our correction proposal that will then be reviewed and signed off by the physician. Excellent. And to add to that, we actually can drop 3D objects. So this is an actual rendering in 3D of the femur. And here is the cutting guide which I can overlay onto the femur to make the necessary cuts and, and really see what that looks like in that space. Uh, again, leveraging the assets that we have here. If we keep walking further, we can see an aortic aneurysm model. We've got the original scan here. We've got a 3D rendering. And then we've got an actual 3D object of the model here, which I can manipulate in space, make smaller, make larger and really look at the anatomy of this aneurysm uh, within that setting. I can all... And this video will demonstrate image-guided percutaneous coil embolization of an ascending aortic pseudoaneurysm. This is a 77-year-old lady who was one month status post a David procedure, which is repair of the aortic valve and replacement of an ascending aortic aneurysm with a Dacron graft. She represented with a sinkable episode and when a chest CT was performed, it showed a distal anastomotic pseudoaneurysm. Thank you, Dr. Lumsden. And we'll continue to walk into other parts of MITEI where I've laid out other digital content, just to show you, for example, what you could do within an office setting. Um, and I'm using my office, for example, to showcase the site for the Center for Rapid Device Translation and a very quick picture of me. If you're looking for me, Perhaps you can even click on my picture and it'll send me an email You can, or a voicemail and send me a message. Okay, thank you, Homer, for putting that tour together. Um, again, so, you know, just to recap, you know, Mightyverse is an extend reality extension of Mighty. Okay, you know, we were limited by reality a couple of years ago, so we, we went ahead and built a new one and we're testing that out. Um, if you're interested, again, Mightyverse.app, you can go there, put your email in, we'll get in contact with you. Um, and I think as we close out, I, I would just like to thank all our guests today. It's been a pleasure having everyone here. You know, it's, I love these virtual events because we can really pull in everyone from around the world. Um, I'd also like to give a shout out to Nick Collins, sorry, uh, David Collins and Nick Turner for all their, their help over the last year in getting the, the content set up. I'd like to thank the video production team for a stellar performance today. And I'd like to thank everyone here at Mairi and the Baker Heart and Vascular Center and Academic Institute for making this happen. Last thing, next year, October the 3rd and 4th is going to be next year's symposium and it's going to be on site here at Mighty. It's going to be a big two day event, lots of surprises, lots installed. Um, everyone that registered for today, they will be getting an email just stating when those days are, when they can register, etc. And on that note, I'll give you back a couple of minutes. Thank you very much. Thank you for your time. Goodbye. <laughs>